Voila! Finally done! The most exhausting part of moving mansion was having to rearrange my Birkin collection. But at least my walk-in closet is bigger than my last one, so now I need to pick out the perfect outfit for school tomorrow. First impressions are crucial. This is my favorite fit at the moment, but let's get a second opinion. Mom, Dad, what do you think? Wellstone High's new Queen Bee's incoming! Adele, there you are. I bought you a few new items. Ooh, goody! I love surprises. What is this? Mom, are these for the maids? Honey pie, it appears that well-off residents in this neighborhood have been targeted by a dangerous robbers gang. For your safety, you'd better tone down your outfits. At least until they catch the thieves. I know it's not ideal, but safety first. Come on, pumpkin. Isn't this shirt adorable? No, it's not. I'm not being seen dead in that rag. My parents were probably just exaggerating. Let's see. Hmm. It seems some girl had her Hermes bag stolen, another her Cartier bracelet, and some guy his Rolex. No, oh, no! I couldn't let some crooks take my precious babies! The next morning, I trudged downstairs in those awfully bland clothes. Ugh, they were itchy and smelt so bad. Darling, this will only be for a little while. You're our only angel, and we simply couldn't bear it if anything were to happen to you. <sighs> Fine. Where's my chauffeur? I want to take the Porsche today. At least that can still save my grand entrance. Absolutely not. If you do that, you may as well be wearing a beacon to attract those thieves. I think it's best if you take the bus. The bus? Before I could protest anymore, Mom kissed me on the forehead, burst into tears, and ran off hysterically. Have a wonderful day, sweetie. Great. So much worrying for me. Now I had no choice but to find the bus stop, wherever that was. I wandered around the corner when suddenly, a deafening scream came from behind me. Thief! Watch out! I spun around to see a guy running towards me, so I immediately sped off. But soon I felt the thief reach me. Terrified, I crouched down, raised my bag. Here, take it! Don't hurt me! But no reply. I peered up and saw the guy was ahead of me and was restraining a bad guy. Turns out, he wasn't the thief, and the actual thief wasn't after me. Oops, how embarrassing. Let's just leave ASAP, but I ended up crashing into some flashy car. Are you okay? It's the guy who just caught the thief. I froze. He's so handsome. I was about to reply when the car door swung open, and this angry rich guy stormed over to me. Are you blind? You scratched my car. Pay up. Leave her alone, Bernie. Hmm, he's handsome. And kind. Totally different from that arrogant Bernie guy. Turns out he's called Roy. We all go to the same school. Better still, Roy offered to drive me there in his fancy car. What a shame that I bumped into a hottie looking like a mess. If only he knew the real me. He'd fall for me hard. We're made for each other. We even have matching cars. We arrived at school to a bunch of fangirls waiting to greet Roy. Makes sense. He's handsome and oh so rich. What's not to like? Roy told them I was new here, but they didn't seem so pleased to see me. Roy, it's so sweet you're helping out the less fortunate. Ugh, these peasants! If only they knew the real me! To prove to Roy that I was so much better than those other girls the next day, I snuck my designer clothes to school to get changed. When I spotted Roy, I hurried over to dazzle him, but that annoying fangirl Maya interrupted us again. Nice try, new girl, but your knockoff clothes won't impress anyone. You shouldn't judge someone by their clothes. That's very kind of you, Roy. But we both know that only a Chanel girly like me would be a good match for you. Everyone started to make a fuss, but Roy just shooed them away to leave. Ugh, thanks to those wannabes, I'd missed my chance with him. After class, I changed back into my boring plain clothes ready for the bus home. What is this tacky fabric? Suddenly, Roy passed by. Cute shirt. I think it suits you much better. There's nothing wrong with dressing down. It brings out one's natural beauty better. Wow, it seems that rich boy Roy wasn't a show-off. What a blessing in disguise this pretending to be poor was. Roy clearly liked me more this way, so I should keep it up. Once, I pushed a bike to the end of the street and waited for Roy to pass by, so I could make out it was broken and ask for a lift. It's definitely not because I don't know how to ride a bike. <laughs> Over the next few days, I clung to Roy. I told him how I didn't know anyone at school yet or where anything was as an excuse to get him to take me to the canteen. But look at the food. Really? Are we supposed to eat this? Oh, we've never gotten to eat stuff like this at home. Uh, looks yummy. Luckily, Roy felt sorry for me even more and just caringly explained the menu. The next day, I brought in my own lunchbox with Roy's favorite, mac and cheese, which obviously was made by my chef, but he doesn't need to know that. He clearly enjoyed it, but then commented, Adele, you shouldn't waste your money and effort on me like that. Please just spend it on yourself instead. Ugh, even though he was wealthy, he was so thoughtful of others. Hmm, how come I'd never thought of things this way? 
On the weekend, I went to a fair my parents were sponsoring in a nearby town. I wandered off by myself and suddenly spotted a familiar face selling caramel apples with some kids. Oh no, Roy, what was he doing here? He couldn't see me all dressed up like this. Before I could dart away, his eyes locked directly on mine. Roy, hello, why are you looking at me so strangely? Ah, uh, uh, this dress, it's handmade. And um, my mom found these shoes somewhere. Enough about me, <laughs> why are you here? Oh, I'm volunteering at an orphanage. The kids, they're the ones that grew these apples. Oh my god, could this guy be any cuter? Even though he's loaded, he's so down to earth and humble and he wants to make a difference. I really have to learn a lot from him. Later, I took the bus back to town with Roy. We continued chatting even after stepping off the bus, but then this convertible pulled up alongside us. Ugh, it was Bernie and Maya. Oh no, don't let her drag you down like that, baby. Where's your Rolls Royce? What's this? Isn't this Chanel's archive? Adele, are you? Yeah, right? This is a fake one. Now, please, leave. I grabbed Roy's arm and pulled him the opposite way. Adele, are you okay discrediting your image in front of Bernie like that? I mean, he's popular and rich. Everyone wants to impress him. I'm not that kind of social climber. He's such a conceited, bossy jerk. Unlike you. Roy seemed touched by my words, as he invited me to go to the grape farm with him next weekend. Okay, so I thought Roy had invited me here for some relaxation and fresh air. I didn't expect to be made to carry out tasks. This was probably his way of challenging me, and no chance I was going to fail it. The workers here are immigrants from different countries, but thanks to my extensive traveling, I, ahem, <clears throat> know quite a bit of foreign languages, enough to ask them to show me what to do. And it just so happens that my parents are obsessed with vintage wines, so I know my Chardonnay from my Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, these grapes will make a fine Malbec. Ne sais pas, Pierre? Oh, uh, I taught myself different languages and watched various documentaries to improve my skill set. Uh, it's nothing. Later, Roy needed to re-roof the barn, so we climbed up a ladder while I stayed below and passed him tools. But the ladder began to wobble, and he screamed at me to jump back. But instead, I stayed there and held up my arms to catch him. Are you okay? That was dangerous. Why didn't you step away? I couldn't watch you get hurt. Also, to have you falling for me would be everything I ever wanted. We rested in the corner, and that's when Roy told me that he liked me. I think you're one of a kind, but I don't want there to be secrets between us. I like you too, and that's true. We should have zero secrets, so I want to come clean. My family's actually rich, super rich. I'm sorry for not letting you know sooner. What about you, Roy? Do you have any secrets? Um, actually, my parents own this farm. Only, the workers don't know about this, so please don't tell them. Aw, humble Roy. He's really the sweetest. He was also very understanding about the reason why I had to hide my true background. Finally, the gang leader of the robberies was caught. Things seemed to be back to normal, and this meant I could publicly go back to being me again. Everyone looked at me with different eyes. Only, Roy didn't seem all that impressed. When I invited him to my favorite restaurant, he told me he didn't like those stuffy places. Plus, he had too much work at the farm. I really wanted to go on a proper date with Roy, but I suppose just being with him was enough. So I agreed to help him out at the farm. As we waited for my chauffeur to pick us up, someone leaped out of a bush and snatched my gold necklace. As I gripped my bare neck in shock, Roy darted after them and grabbed it back. I noticed the robber say something to Roy before he fled. I later asked Roy about it, but he just shrugged it off. The next day at school, a woman in tatty clothes ran in, saying she urgently needed to find her son. When she saw Roy, she rushed towards him. Oh, here you are. I thought something happened to you. Someone told me you were in trouble. Everyone began chattering. Roy, you're wealthy. Why don't you buy your mom some nice clothes? He looked dumbfounded, then muttered, I'm not rich. I lied. What? Why? You always said money didn't matter, but you live in this facade? Roy avoided my eyes, mumbled out a sorry, then led his mom outside. So, this whole time, I didn't know who he truly was? Feeling hurt and deceived, I screamed out that it was over between us. My heart was cracked into two. This was horrible. Then I arrived home to see my parents frantic. Someone had sent them a threatening letter saying, I will come when you least expect it and take what I want. My parents were terrified that something bad would happen to me, so they hired bodyguards to protect me. The next day, a whole squad showed up, and to my utter shock, amongst them was... Roy, what are you doing here? What's your scheme? I replied to the advert. I didn't know it was for you. Please, Adele, I need this job. I could really do with the money. I hated that he'd lied to me, but I couldn't be that heartless. So, I agreed that he could be my bodyguard, as long as he knew his limit. Having Roy follow me everywhere really sucked. So when Bernie appeared and asked me out, even though I didn't particularly like the jerk, I agreed to it. 
It felt good to dress up and be taken to fancy restaurants, and it felt even better to see how raging Roy looked. On my way to the restroom, Roy stopped me. Bernie's not who you think he is. Please stay away from him. I put his words down to jealousy and shrugged him off me. If anything, what he said made me even more determined to get closer to Bernie. So when he suggested I throw a party at my mansion for my 16th birthday and invite all my friends, I immediately agreed. The party was great. It's been a while since I was able to have fun and forget about the recent shenanigan for a moment. Thanks to Bernie. Wait a minute, Bay. I've prepared a big surprise for you. The lights went out, and I waited, wondering what it could be. But it's been a little too long. I called out for Bernie, but nothing. I didn't hear from Roy, either. Realizing something was wrong, I found my way inside the house and was suddenly grabbed by someone. Shh, let me show you something. He led me to the garage, and I caught Bernie trying to start the supercar. Next to him was a bag full of priceless jewelry. That was fast, but I didn't come here alone. Yeah, but your teammates are already taken care of. Then Roy opened the garage door, and the cops rushed in to arrest Bernie. Outside, I saw a couple of other robbers being led away in handcuffs. You again? You can act all high and mighty all you want, but you're no different from me. It turns out, even after the leader was caught, the robbers gang was still alive and well, and Bernie was a member. He only pretended to be rich to fool his victims and provide intel to the gang. Knowing my true background, he's the one who stole my necklace. But the mission failed because Roy stopped him. As revenge, Bernie leaked information about Roy's family. I should have exposed your rich kid facade sooner. I let you off several times out of respect for our close friendship, but you still wouldn't leave me alone. Close friend? Who falsely accused me of theft then? As he was being led away, I suddenly remembered something. What about the letter? Why did you do such a stupid, unnecessary thing? Bernie looked confused and insisted he didn't have time to write insignificant things like letters. It was me. I wrote it. I knew Bernie wouldn't stop trying to steal from you, and I didn't want you to get hurt. So I sent the warning letter for your family to take cover. Roy walked off, but I went after him. What about some accusation between you and Bernie? Is it the reason why you have to live a fake life? Roy explained he and Bernie used to be close friends. Roy was always poor when Bernie's family was a little better off. Roy discovered that Bernie was involved in some petty thefts, so Roy tried to make him stop, but he only took revenge by accusing Roy. Although there was no specific evidence, due to his poor family background, people always assumed that he'd done it. So when Roy transferred schools, he decided to pretend to be rich, so no one falsely accused him again. Oh, my poor Roy. Ugh, why is finding my balance so tricky? Ouch! Roy helped me up and checked I wasn't hurt. You don't have to do this. Just live your life as comfortably as before. Nope, I want to do this. This way I can cycle to see you whenever I want. A flashy car or fancy outfit doesn't change my value as a person, but working with you felt good. And you know what? Even though you're not as well-dressed as when we first met, I still like you a lot. This was like a dream come true. That gorgeous man in front of me is Ethan. My crush since I was just 14. Back then, Ethan was my dad's business partner. So he'd often come over to our house for dinner. For years, I adored him in secret. But now, at 19, I could finally be honest about my feelings. So when I ran into him by chance in the grocery store, I felt like it was meant to be. He invited me for a drink in the cafe nearby, and we instantly hit it off. We started dating, and now we're an official couple. There's just one thing that worries me. Ethan is recently divorced and has a 10-year-old daughter, Clarice, who he has full-time. While daydreaming, I couldn't hide away from the thought of being someone's stepmom. Oh my, I didn't want to become a mom yet. Don't worry, Clarice is a cute kid. I just know you two will get along. Clarice gave me a devious smile the moment she saw me. Another fish got hooked. Huh? Hey, that's not the right manner. Apologize, now! Ethan immediately said. Clarice let out a loud, Ugh! Then reluctantly apologized. Great! When has it ever been easy to be friends with a naughty ten-year-old girl? I understand this better than most, as I have a little sister. She's either giving me a headache or crazing at me for candy, and I could tell that Clarice was going to be no different. <sighs> One day, Ethan called me in a panic, saying he had an urgent business trip. They informed me at the very last minute. I didn't have time to find a babysitter. Can you help me take care of Clarice for a few days? 
What? I've only just met the girl, and now I have to mind her for a few days? I still didn't know what to say when Ethan continued. I'll make it up to you after this. And then, the next thing I knew, Clarice was at my front door. Oh gosh, somebody help me! Well, you know those girls that age, like my little sister? I kept pouring out while Mike just smiled and slightly shook his head. I have to make her like me to win over Ethan. So, lovely Mike, can you please come hang out with us? Seriously? Please? Aren't you good with the ladies? Fine. You know I can't say no to you. I took Clarice to a theme park. She frowned the moment she saw Mike. Um, who's this? I don't like strangers. I smiled and said, This is Mike. He's really cool and I don't care. Cindy? What kind of situation did you drag me into? Man, I had to ask myself that question. This wasn't what I envisioned it to be. The outing turned into a competition between them. Clarice challenged Mike to play game after game with her until she won. In the end, they played with the water guns, and I knew for sure Mike let her win. But as soon as he let go of his water gun, Clarice squirted water all over him, leaving him completely drenched. Oops. What on earth is this? That's the price for the loser. <laughs> Okay, Cindy, that's enough. Have fun! And he stormed off. Oh no, what have I done to him? I stood there dumbfounded, staring at Clarice. Okay, so it was kind of funny, but I couldn't laugh at my poor friend. I want ice cream! Clarice grinned, then skipped away. Hmm, ice cream. A girl after my own heart. On the way home, we talked so much about her fave show, The Babysitter's Club, and how Stacy is her favorite character. Hmm, maybe the day wasn't so bad after all. A few days later, Ethan returned, and I was really excited to see him. Thank you so much for taking care of Clarice. Meanwhile, I noticed Clarice was slowly backing out, with an awkward look on her face. I thought she'd be as happy as me to see him, but it didn't seem that way. Darling, are you okay? Are you sick? I... I'm okay. I need to go to my room. After that, at dinner, the question, are you sick, was raised no less than ten times, and it made me feel sick too. I said I'm not sick, and I don't want to see a doctor. Ethan, I think Clarice is fine, so maybe stop asking her. Hearing that... Ethan seemed uncomfortable and turned away. Weird. What was wrong with them? Maybe this was just something they did. Hmm. Whatever it is, I wasn't enjoying this heavy atmosphere. The next day after lunch, Clarice was helping me clean the table while Ethan was packing to go on his next trip. She insisted on washing the dishes while I said goodbye to Ethan. We were hugging in the doorway when suddenly... I heard a loud scream coming from the kitchen. Ethan and I both rushed in there and saw Clarice crying as she gripped her hand. Ethan frantically asked, What happened? While I quickly searched for a first aid kit. I was washing the dishes, but I accidentally cut my hand. Cindy, I'm sorry. I wasn't being careful. Please don't punish me. What? What was she talking about? Ethan seemed to have the same question as me. Cindy always makes me do the chores. She told me if I do them badly, I can't have dinner. Huh? Why was she saying things that weren't true? Turning pale with shock, I muttered out, No, that's not true. I, I don't want to stay here. Dad, let me go home. Clarice interrupted me as she was crying harder. I'm so sorry, but I have to go now. I don't even know if you're lying or not. How can you say that to me? Clarice shouted. You monster! Then she ran upstairs. I stood there not knowing what to do. My brain couldn't process what just happened. Ethan looked at me and sighed. Why didn't he say anything? He didn't honestly think I was capable of doing that. Did he? I decided I needed to confront Clarice about this. So I went up to her room and calmly said, Clarice, 
Why did you say that? You forced me to do all the chores. What? How can you lie like that? I never do such a thing. Oh, but are people going to believe you or a poor little girl? Oh, my God. There was me, thinking she was a sweet kid, when in actual fact, she was the complete opposite. I rushed outside and, shaking, I pulled my phone out. I called Mike and told him everything. Oh boy, that kid is complicated. Maybe she doesn't want you to be with her dad. But even so, what she did was weird. I think you should stay away from them. But how to? I couldn't just run away. Besides, Ethan was on his trip, again, and I was in charge of her. So I kept my distance, no more talking or having fun. But it seemed that Clarice had other ideas. I was watching TV in the living room when Clarice appeared and pulled my shirt. Cindy, I want you to play video games with me. The more silent I was, the harder she pulled. No, Clarice, I'm not in the mood. I shouted, go play by yourself. Then I walked off. A few minutes later, Cass, a senior student, came over to give me some documents. We sat down and had some iced tea. Then suddenly, bam, and a cry. Oh no. Cass and I rushed to the noise. Clarice had fallen down the stairs in the basement and was surrounded by the laundry basket and dirty clothes. Cass quickly ran down there and helped her up. Are you okay? What happened? Cindy told me to do the laundry in time. The basket was so full, so I slipped. No, no, no! I screamed inside my head when Cass gave me a concerned look. Cass, please, I'll explain later. Can you please leave? Why? I screamed at Clarice's face the moment Cass left. If you don't play with me, you'll be a child abuser. You'll have to go to jail. Ugh, this is driving me crazy. Just a few days ago, she wanted her dad to take her away from here, and now she's blackmailing me for not playing with her? Right at that moment, Ethan called. Hi, Cindy. I just want to check on you two. Is Clarice sick or anything? Ugh, what on earth is this? Am I crazy? Or are these two actually weird? OMG. I need Mike. Now. Please, take me away from here, I said as I opened the door for Mike. Stop! Clarice shouted. You two can't go anywhere! Oh, now you're telling me what not to do? If you go, I'll tell the whole world how badly you've been treating me. You'll both go to jail. So that's your scam? Her smirk disappeared. She turned pale and stuttered. N no, it... It was my dad's. Your dad's scam? Clarice looked flustered as she realized what she had just blurted out. Then she quickly covered it up. Nothing! Mike sat down and looked at her with stern eyes. I stood there, waiting for the answer. I... Um... My daddy made me! Eventually, Clarice confessed. Turns out... Ethan was a professional scammer who scams young, wealthy girls into giving him money. Worse, he dragged his daughter into his scheme. The plan went like this. He used his handsome looks to flirt with the girls, then Clarice's cuteness to get the girls' empathy. After that, he would go on some last-minute business trip and ask them to take care of Clarice. Meanwhile, Clarice would pretend to be seriously sick. When Ethan arrived back, he would persuade the girls to hand over money for hospital fees, then he and Clarice would disappear out of their lives. At first he told me to do what he said and he'd get me a bike. What about the abusing lie you made up? I asked, still shocked. I made up that excuse so Dad would take me away. I really like you, so I don't want his plan to work. Then why did you continue to act up? Because Cindy was mad at me. And I wanted her to play with me, so I pulled that trick again. Tears streamed down my face. Unbelievable! I voluntarily stepped into his trap right at the beginning. He didn't even have to do much. I felt like such an idiot. After that, 
We exposed Ethan. Clarice helped us, too. Turns out, he's bankrupt, which is why his wife left him and why he's no longer my dad's business partner. Ethan was arrested, but Clarice's mom was out of the country, and she refused to return for her daughter. To be honest, I love Clarice, and I didn't want her to live in the orphanage. So I let her live at my place for a while before I told my parents everything. Obviously, my parents have more capacity and power to deal with this. It took a while for Clarice to get over her guilt and settle in, but now we get on better than ever. She's a sweet, cute girl who deserves far better than her parents have given her. Then one day, I came back home from college to find Clarice placing some roses on the dining table, which was already romantically set up with candles and steak. Cindy, you're back! How can you prepare a full dinner like this? Clarice didn't say anything. She just giggled and ran to her room. Someone hugged me from behind. Would you mind being my date tonight? It was Mike. Thinking about it, I guess my perfect man was right under my nose this entire time. So, grinning, I turned around and replied, I thought you'd never ask. Hey, that guy over there just asked for your info, the bartender said, which made me turn and look around. Oh, he's gone. As you can see, I'm sitting at the bar of a five-star resort. No, I'm not rich. Instead, I took out all my savings and decided to splurge them on enjoying every single last day left of my life. It all started months ago. I had this constant aching and exhaustion, I blamed work stress, but my symptoms grew worse. Eventually, I went to the doctor and sat there in stunned shock as I heard the words cancer and progressive. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of hospital appointments and treatments. I had chemo and my lovely long hair fell out. I just felt tired and hopeless all of the time. Enough had I had this. I stopped the chemotherapy, quit my job, and decided to enjoy the little time I had left. The Hawaiian beach is so beautiful. Then suddenly, someone walked straight into me. Ugh, their drink soaked me. I heard them say, Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh, hey, you're the girl who sat alone at the bar earlier. I looked up, and wow, he was handsome. I shook my head and insisted it was my fault for not paying attention. After that, he joined me for a walk, and we started chatting. Oh, his name is Blake, by the way. So, the next day, I asked him out for lunch. I don't have much of an appetite these days, and the most I could do was staring down at my barely-touched plate. Then, I knew I needed to be honest with him. Hey, Blake, I really like you, and want to get to know you more, but I have cancer and don't have long left. At first, there was a sickening silence, but then he took my hand, and can you believe it? He said he wanted to get to know me, too. The next few weeks with him were magical. Then we came back to the city and continued dating. Blake was so amazing and constantly showered me with love. One night after dinner, Blake drove us up to this hill. He said he wanted to show me Orion's belt, and it was so romantic— I didn't want to ruin the moment, but there was something I needed to tell him. Blake, I saw the doctor today. He said that nothing has changed. Although he didn't mention it, I guess I don't really have much time left. My tears streamed down my face. I've had the best time with you. I really do think I love you. Suddenly, Blake got down on one knee and asked me, My darling Lucy, will you marry me? This is the least I can do for you. I was speechless, so I nodded and then held him tightly in my arms. I was too happy. I couldn't help sharing our love story on social media. Soon, thousands of people were liking and sharing it, saying what an inspirational couple we were. This was crazy, but amazing. Their support made me feel like I could take on my cancer, the world, everything. 
I started noticing that Blake was getting a lot of attention from other girls. They knew he was the guy who proposed to the dying girl, so they seemed to flock around him and admire him. Then one day, when we were at the wedding dress store together, I stepped out of the fitting room in this beautiful gown, feeling like a princess. But then I spotted Blake talking to some other girl. She touched his shoulder, and I overheard her say, Your fiancé is very lucky to have you. Then she leaned in closer to him. Blake? I hissed at him. Baby, how do I look? He turned away from the girl and stared at me. Yeah, gorgeous. He awkwardly smiled. I couldn't help but feel terrible. I know he's an attractive man, but he was about to marry me. It was not nice at all having him flirt with someone else at my dress fitting. Still, I tried to put it all aside, as I wanted to enjoy what little time I had left. The wedding was a dream come true. It was such a magical day. Then right before our honeymoon, I went to see my doctor. To my complete and utter shock, he told me, I'm pleased to inform you that you're in recovery. Oh my god, I couldn't believe my ears. I was getting better? I rushed home and told Blake the good news. Only his reaction wasn't what I expected. His face dropped, and at first he was speechless. Then he stuttered, Congrats, honey. Hmm, what did that even mean? Regardless of this, our honeymoon was marvelous. My appetite was back, and I was making the most of it. Yum! Food tastes so good. This didn't go unnoticed by Blake, and he tutted, Can you try chewing more gently? Whatever. I was intent on enjoying my food. When we arrived back home, I moved into his apartment. For God's sake, there were dirty plates and smelly socks everywhere. How could someone so meticulous about their looks live in such a state? I told myself that it was fine. I loved him, so I could learn to love his mess. (sighs) Being alive felt so good. So admittedly, I may have overdone it on the snacks. Cake, meals out, and yeah. I'd gained some extra pounds, so household chores were a bit too much for me. Besides, why should I have to do them? It was his mess. But one time, when I was sick of his stinky underpants everywhere, I asked him, How can a guy who looks like you live in this rat hole? Go clean up. But he ignored me and went straight to bed. And it took no time for his loud thunder snores to follow. What the hell? Where was the kind, charming man I married? Fed up, I tried my best to clean up the place a little bit. I was out of breath and sweating a lot. My head was super itchy, so I took off my wig and scratched my scalp. At that moment, I heard Blake screaming and when I turned around, he was clutching his face in fear. Baby, what's wrong? I rushed to him. Oh, I got it. I laughed out. It was just too uncomfortable to wear this wig, so I took it off. That's all? But look, my hair is growing back again. Shaking, he stuttered. You were wearing a wig this whole time? You look terrifying. Well... Yeah, I suppose jagged growing hair made me look quite creepy. (laughs) Shouldn't you be happy for me? I mumbled and forced a smile while trying to put the wig back on. Knowing that I was able to live life again was incredible. But living Blake with my moody, uncaring husband, now that wasn't so great. One evening, he came home from work in a foul mood and started shouting at me for not tidying up. I told him I shouldn't have to, as it wasn't my mess. He scowled at me. I single-handedly provide for the both of us. Come home to see you chilling on your huge backside, and you dare talk to me like that? You're the one who needs to get up and work, since you eat double the amount I do. His words hurt, so with teared-up eyes, I said to him, How dare you talk to me like that? Blake was about to say something, but he paused, then just sighed. Look, I'm sorry, babe. I know you're recovering. I sharply stared at him and said, I didn't do anything for dinner, so let's eat out. I was enjoying my rotary chicken. It was so good that I might have taken 
too big of a bite and it lodged in my throat. Soon I was choking. I couldn't breathe. Afraid, I looked at Blake for help, but he was scrolling through his phone. And to my disbelief, he walked off to the bathroom. I kept thudding the table to call for help. Luckily, a waiter rushed over and hit me real hard on the back, and I managed to spit the piece of chicken out. When Blake returned, I angrily asked, How the hell could you leave me like that? What are you talking about, baby? I saw you enjoying your food. Are you done? Let's go home. Ugh! He definitely knew I was choking. What a jerk. Everything I once thought and expected from him shattered. He was willing to let me choke to death over helping me. The problem was our love story was so famous now. And even though I knew Blake and I couldn't bear each other, the thought of us breaking up and being heckled by others made me feel so sick. I guess I was stuck with him forever. So we had to continue tolerating each other. Then one evening, while I was munching on potato chips and watching TV, my phone rang. It was a strange number. Hello? Are you Blake's wife? Blake's been in a car accident, and we really need you to come here. I froze for a few seconds. Sorry, wrong number, and hung up. My phone rang several more times, but I didn't answer. The guilt started to creep up on me, so I grabbed my bag and rushed to the hospital. The nurse told me to sign some papers so Blake could have his surgery. With a pen in hand, I hesitated. Excuse me, where is the organ donating section? I asked. My husband is willing to donate if anything bad happens. This is not the right time to ask me that question, the nurse yelled at me. Right at that moment, Blake's parents rushed in panicking. I gave them the papers and sneaked back to the apartment. After that, I thought long and hard about our relationship. It had been so passionate at first, but I realized I didn't love him at all, and neither did he. All our decisions were made intensely quickly, based on the idea that I might die later. We were too stubborn to admit defeat and walk away, and now we were miserable. A few weeks later, Blake came home in a wheelchair, and we both sat in awkward silence. Then I broke the ice. That night, when I choked at the restaurant, did you ignore me on purpose? Blake answered me with another question. Is it true you wanted to donate my organs instead of helping me get my surgery? I replied, I'm sorry. That was the only way I could briefly think of to get out of this marriage. He sighed. I know. Me too. I think we're just too similar, and that's why we don't work. He paused. I think it's time we put an end to this. So finally, we stopped putting up with each other and filed for a divorce. People on social media were furious and posted a lot of venomous comments, such as, so much for being an inspirational couple, and this screams out scam marriage to me. I decided to close all of my online accounts. Their opinions don't matter anymore. I have my family's support. That's more important. Surprisingly, I'm still friends with Blake. Hey, we went through a lot together, and he's not all bad. I just never want to live with him ever again. (laughs) I even met my current boyfriend through Blake, as he introduced me to him. How funny is that? Sometimes things don't work out as planned, but that's okay. Living a lie just to save a bruised ego is much worse. Oh, by the way, this is my real hair. I am now completely healthy. Remember, you only live once, so make sure you don't waste your time trying to please others, and instead, you embrace life and live it at its best. Have you ever wondered what being a parent would be like? How about if you suddenly became a parent and your parent became a teenager? Well, it happened to me, and I'm here to tell you all about it. Hello, everybody. My name's Heaven, and I'm 17. But don't let my name deceive you, because this Heaven came straight out of hell. I suppose I've never been the easiest child. Back when I was younger, I had a lot of temper tantrums and outbursts. Once, when I was eight, this boy took the green crayon I wanted, so I snatched it off him, then snapped it in half. 
He burst into tears, and the teacher got involved and tried to put me in the timeout corner, so I screamed at her and even gave her some bruises. The teacher rang my parents and told them this was the last strike, and I'd been expelled. When they picked me up, my dad just sighed and stayed quiet, but my mom yelled at me. Well, I hope you're happy now, heaven. You've brought shame to our family, and now we've got to find another school willing to take you. Now, nine years later, and the relationship between mom and me is worse than ever. We just don't see eye to eye on anything. To be honest, we're like strangers. She has absolutely no idea what it feels like to be a teenager, and her super strict rules are ridiculous, such as no boyfriends until I'm 18, no parties, no drinking, no staying out past 8.30 p.m., no unhealthy foods. No, 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 no. She was such a fun killer. Jeez, who was she to try and control me like this? Ugh. Me being me, I tried to find my way around these stupid rules. I made out I was having a girly sleepover at my friend Clara's house, then ended up going to a party. I said I was at an after-school club, when really, I went on a date with a boy, and I chucked the healthy packed lunches she made me in the trash and ordered a greasy burger and loaded cheese fries instead. I hated the fact that mom was ruining my life with all of her dumb rules, and she hated the fact that I didn't respect her enough to follow her dumb rules. Because of this, we argued. A lot. And my little bro John and my dad often found themselves stuck in the middle. I guess that they couldn't stand the icy atmosphere between us. So eventually, they themselves prepared for a family day out. And it was certainly going to fix nothing. Her rules still followed us to the park, and she'd even stopped me talking to this really cute guy and shouted at me to go mind John. Ugh! I wasn't here to be a maid. Then when we got home, she insisted I help her cook dinner. So I poured dad a beer, and when I thought mom wasn't looking, I slurped back the rest of the can. Suddenly, my mom screamed out, What do you think you're doing? You're too young to be drinking. I just rolled my eyes and said, What? It was a tiny sip. Stop being so uptight, else you'll turn into a wrinkly old prune. Then I threw the can on the floor and walked off. She gave me a fierce glare, but I didn't care. How could she be just so serious? So when we were all sitting around the table for dinner, I could feel the tension between me and mom. She passed John a plate full of chicken nuggets, but she passed me a plate heaped full of broccoli. Yuck. Um, where are my nuggets? I asked. Mom replied, John is a growing boy. You, however, need to eat some vegetables, as you're getting a little chubby. How dare she? I wasn't even fat. In fact, I'm so skinny, I could be a model. If anyone needed to watch their weight, it was her, not me. She was the one squeezing herself into her old pair of skinny jeans. So I grabbed my plate of broccoli and threw it in the trash. Mom got up and said, Fine, go hungry, see if I care and you can clean up after yourself from now on. I yelled back, Ridiculous! There's nothing in my stomach and you're giving me chores? Is this child abuse? But then my dad startled us by slamming his fist on the table. That's enough! Both of you, start acting like grown-ups! We both muttered out sorry. Then dad came up with his bonkers idea. Okay, so if you two cannot live in harmony... Why don't you trade places? Mom and I were kind of confused. What do you mean? I said to him. Well, it's simple. Heaven, you'll switch places with Mom and do the housework, shopping, making dinner, and taking care of John, and so on. While Ariana, he looked at Mom, you'll relive your teenage years and go to school. Let's say, for two days. Mom looked thrilled at the prospect of being me. As for me... I wasn't convinced. I mean, who likes doing chores? Besides, tomorrow at school was class picnic day, which meant no classes, lots of tasty food, and plenty of time to stare at cute boys. But mom seemed so excited at the idea of being me, so I decided I could take advantage of this. Does this mean I don't have to follow any stupid rules? I asked, and mom and dad nodded in agreement. Okay then, all the strict rules are gone. 
Does this mean I can eat chocolate in bed? John asked. I grinned. You betcha! Mom just shrugged and said, It's okay, Mom. Now I have to prepare stuff for my picnic. And she excitedly ran upstairs. This would be a breeze. Right? I mean, how hard could being Mom actually be? The next morning, John woke me up extra early and insisted I make him breakfast. Yawn. While I was pouring cereal into a bowl for him, Mom appeared. She was wearing her hat backwards. Jeez, someone seriously needed to tell her it wasn't the 90s anymore. Have fun, Ariana. I winked at her. You too, Mom. She winked back. I watched her through the window. As she got on the school bus, she turned to me and did the peace out sign. Jeez, could she be any more uncool? Whatever. She could be as cringy as she wanted. I didn't care, as I had the whole day at home alone. Or at least, until I had to pick up my bro from school. I didn't bother loading up the dishwasher, and I sidestepped past the massive pile of laundry and decided to spend the morning on the couch watching a chick flick and painting my nails. Ugh, this was the life. A few hours passed, and I was so bored and hungry, so I went into the kitchen to look for food. But the cupboards were empty. Then I noticed a shopping list and some money on the counter. Reluctantly, I walked to the local store, but I ignored the list and bought lots of snacks. Hey, I was mum, so I made the rules. In the end, I found myself so bored that I actually ended up doing the laundry. I didn't really know what I was doing, so I threw everything into the machine, fiddled with the dial, and hoped for the best. Then my phone rang. It was Clara. So I answered and she said, Hey, why is your mom here instead of you? I told her about the switch up, then asked her what my mom was up to. She was quiet for a second, then said, Um, well, she's definitely enjoying the picnic. In fact, she's showing Mrs. Puller her dabbing skills. What? My mom was dabbing, which no one did anymore. And in front of our ancient science teacher? Was she trying to humiliate me? Whatever, my mom could get on with it. I had house chores to do. Jeez, what's with chores? They seriously never seem to end. By the end of the day, I was so exhausted that I ordered takeout for everyone, then slumped in front of the TV. I finally had the option to stay out late, but I didn't have the energy to do it. Then, the next day, when I was doing yet more house chores, my friend Patrick sent me a photo. It was mom. She was wearing a cheerleader's outfit that exposed her midriff. What? She was just at a casual football match. No one dressed up for that. Then Patrick sent me another picture. In it, mom was fiddling with her hair and touching some jock's shoulder. O-M-G. Was she trying to flirt with him? Whatever. I didn't have time for this. I had to go pick John up from school then go to the grocery store to get supplies for dinner. We arrived home to find Mom slumped on the couch, surrounded by empty wrappers and cans. On seeing me, she said, Oh, you're back. I told John to go to his room, then I stormed over to Mom and said, What's with all this mess? Clean it up! She just smirked at me and said, Nah, you never clean it up, so why should I? After all, we have switched places, remember? She finished her beer, then burped loudly before she threw the can at my feet, then walked off. This was so annoying. I'd already tidied the living room once today, and now I had to do it again. My mom was so unfair. Then, when I finally managed to grab five minutes to relax with a hot chocolate, loud thudding sounds were coming from upstairs. It was her music. It was so loud, it made the ceiling shake. Jeez. She was so annoying. Then suddenly, it dawned on me. This was how I acted. Mom was just being me. So, okay, I guess I was a little harsh at times. I suppose being mom wasn't as easy as it looks. So I decided to make amends by making a delicious dinner. But there was one problem. I can't cook. In fact, the last time I tried to cook... I set the crepes and the pan on fire. So, for safety purposes, I asked Clara and Patrick to help me. They had cooking class, 
so they knew what to do. We created a feast of barbecue ribs, burgers, cornbread, salad, grape punch, and for dessert, a chocolate lava cake and blueberry pie. I swear they looked so good, I wanted to drool all over them. Mom came downstairs chewing her gum and scrolling through her phone, but then she looked at the food and stuttered, huh, huh, how did you make all of this? Not even I could make this many meals. I just shrugged and said, I had a little help from my friends. No biggie. Then I stopped in front of mom and said, I'm sorry that I've been a bad daughter. I know you do a lot for me, and I promise I'll be better from now on. Mom started crying and said, I'm sorry too. I know it isn't easy being your age. I can't keep up with the trends. I thought dabbing was popular. Anyway, from now on, I'll be fair to you, and we'll have fun together. After that, we hugged it out. Then my dad stood up and said, Well, now anyone want to trade places with me? John immediately raised his hand, and all could see his eyes light up. Soon, we all burst out laughing, thinking about one day John will go to work and talk about dinosaurs at the meetings. Meanwhile, my dad is building a Lego castle for John's kindergarten girlfriend. My family is now happier than ever. It's all thanks to my dad's crazy idea. You should never disrespect your parents. Otherwise, you might just find yourself living in their shoes. Literally. And trust me, I'll take strict rules and being nagging parents any day if the alternative is grocery shopping and house chores. Ugh. Scott, I said it's over. You're just too immature for me. He gave me a quizzing look then said, Huh? What? Babe, we're great together. I rolled my eyes. I just figured I don't need to be with someone with such a childish mentality. I need someone mature and... Whatever, Linda. Find me when you change your mind, he grunted. Then he put his earphones in and walked off. Well, at 15, I needed a guy with a certain maturity, not some loser who still found fart jokes funny. Please. My friends, Patty and Louise, agreed with me. I'm far too popular, pretty, and confident to date just anyone. Anyway, as luck should happen, I was walking along the school corridor when I saw this lost-looking but amazingly handsome guy. Flicking out my hair, I approached him with my friendliest voice. Hey, are you okay? Flustered, he replied, Yes, um, which way is it to the principal's office? I'm going that way anyway, so I'll show you. This was a blatant lie, as my class was in the other direction, but he didn't know that. Later that day, I walked into physics class with Lewis and stopped dead. Standing at the front of the class was that handsome guy. It turns out he was the substitute teacher, and written on the board behind him was the name Mr. Holton. My first name is Colin, by the way, he smiled. I whispered to Lewis, Seems like science class has heated up. Then I walked over to my seat. There's no way I could concentrate on the density of materials, not with the hottest teacher ever sharing the same airspace as me. I needed to find a way to get to know him and show him that I wasn't like the other girls my age. Instead, I was far more mature and self-assured than them. So, at the end of class, I walked over and asked him if he'd go over a few things with me. He gladly agreed, so I got to sit down next to him and daydreamed in the scent of his musky cologne. Physics class became my favorite. With my head in my hands, I watched him address the class. He saw me looking at him a few times, but he always quickly looked away. It's okay. I got it. He was just trying to look professional. Then, one time he asked the question, According to Einstein, is light a partial or a wave? I stuck my hand in the air and grinned. He looked a little flustered. Linda? I puckered my lips and looked straight at him. That shirt color really suits you, sir. It brings out your eyes. Some of the other kids in class laughed, and he awkwardly fiddled with his collar. So cute! Then he coughed and said, <clears throat> Linda, do you know the answer? Oh, what was the question again? I stared dreamily at him. Honestly. I couldn't remember anything afterwards, but 
his charmingly severe look. Then one afternoon, Colin asked me to stay behind after class. Result, he must have fallen for this Linda's irresistible charms, didn't he? I shyly stood before him, and in a serious tone, he said, Linda, is everything okay with you? You seem off lately. No, sorry, it's awful. I glumly looked down at my feet and took a few seconds to continue. My family is so poor, and my home life is just horrible. I only have nice things because my friends lend me stuff. His gaze softened. I pretended to dab at my fake tears. Please, don't tell anyone. I couldn't cope with the shame. It's enough just having you to talk to. I smiled at him. Yeah, sure. He looked at me gently and said, Anytime. Oh my. His eyes were so big and blue and mmm, I could drown in them. He obviously liked me too. He just couldn't do anything about it yet as he was nervous. With him being my teacher and all. But soon he'd realize that me and him were so meant to be. Like Ariana Grande and Dalton Gomez. I continued to stay behind after classes so I could talk to Colin about my make-believe terrible home life. He always listened and told me it'd be okay. He was so sweet and sensitive. Then one time I left Colin's classroom to find Scott there, waiting for me. Ugh. I told him to go away and started walking, but he followed me. So what? You're into old men now? What? I glared at him. Yeah, I'm not stupid. I know you like Mr. Halton. You need to snap out of that dreamland and see he's on a different level to you. Angered by this, I looked him square in the eye and snidely replied, No, Scott, you're the one on a different level to me. About 50 levels down, to be precise. I gave the thumbs down sign. He looked wounded as he turned his back to me and started walking off. He had it coming. I walked outside to see Scott lingering around, talking to Patty and Lewis. They didn't see me, so I overheard Scott say, She can't see how tragic she's being. You know her. She's so stubborn. Of course, Mr. Halton doesn't like her in that way. Ahem. I faked a cough, and they all turned to look at me. I put my hand on my hip and stared them down. Look, I'm sorry, Linda. We're just worried about you. Yeah, this fantasy of yours will hurt you. Ugh! What did they know? I rolled my eyes. For your information, Colin and I are really dating. In fact, he's taking me out tonight, so I can't hang out. I walked off the other way, knowing full well that the looks on their face would be priceless. I know Colin wasn't actually my boyfriend, yet, but I knew it would happen soon. It was written in the stars. The next day, as I walked into school, I noticed some of the other kids whispering to each other and pointing at me. Okay, weird. Maybe it was my new dress or something. I bought it because it was an exact colored match to Colin's eyes. But things got weirder in physics class, because as soon as Colin walked in, everybody started giggling. Colin looked confused and said, Okay, what's so funny? Then this girl, Sally, shyly muttered out, Sir, we heard you have a new girlfriend. He raised an eyebrow. Yes, that's correct. How do you know? He gave a nervous laugh. Actually, this shirt is a gift from her. I felt the entire class's eyes turn to me. Well, except for Collins. I tried to keep my cool, but inside I was fuming. How dare some other woman steal my man and force him to wear that hideous shirt? I knew I needed to keep up the lie, so after class, I walked over to Lewis and Patty and said, How cute does Cullen look in that shirt? They both frowned at me. Then Patty replied, So, you really are dating him? Yep. I gave a nod. Right. She gave a skeptical look. They all needed to realize that Colin and I were the real deal. So I bought a box of candy and cut out a heart-shaped tag saying, Love you, honey, with my candy floss scented gel pen. I did feel kind of nervous as I walked over to him, but our love was meant to be. Hi, Linda. Can I help you? I got you this. I placed the gift down on his desk. He read the note and his face fell. Then, in a firm voice, he said, Look, Linda, this is wrong. No, I shook my head. I know you like me. Linda, please, you're my student. You're just a child. No, we're meant to be together. You love me. I know you do. I don't, he said sternly. Now please leave. He rejected me? This had to be down to his new girlfriend. She was obviously poisoning his mind, as there was no way he couldn't like me. I wasn't leaving the room until he admitted he loved me too. So, crying, 
I sat down on the floor and folded my arms. Right at that moment, Patty and Louise rushed into the room and helped me up. Then they stared daggers at Colin as they led me out into the corridor. Turned out they'd followed me and observed through the window. How embarrassing. Thinking quick, I blubbered out, He's such a jerk. I devoted all of myself to him, but he's bored of me now, so he dumped me. Just like that. My friends comforted me as they told me he wouldn't get away with it. There's no way I could face Colin again just yet. So, I feigned being sick and stayed home. Only when I returned to school, he wasn't there. Then, the principal called me to their office. I walked in to see both my parents sitting there with devastated looks on their faces. Oh no. What was going on? Sweetie, we're sorry for not protecting you more. Mom looked over at me with glassy eyes. Then the principal said, Mr. Holton has been fired. And the police are investigating him. Rest assured, nothing like this will happen again. Huh? Colin had been fired? Why? Then the reality hit me. It was because they thought he'd been having a relationship with me. I muttered out, No, you've got it all wrong. Nothing happened. Linda, I know this is difficult, but he's a bad man. It didn't matter what I said. They remained convinced that I was so manipulated by Colin that I'd say anything to clear his name. Straight after the meeting, I found Patty and Louise, and they confessed that they hated seeing me so upset, so they'd told the principal about me and Colin. I took a deep breath, then I blurted out, but I made it up, all of it. Of course, they were super angry with me for lying, but after bearing their tantrums for some 30 minutes, they agreed to help me clear his name. So they went to the cop station with me, and we told them everything. It worked, as Colin had his name cleared, but Unsurprisingly, he never came back to teach at my school. The three of us were suspended from school, and my parents grounded me for a month. Patty and Louise are still my friends, but I can see they don't trust me anymore. Anytime I tell them anything, they give each other these yeah-right looks. I feel so guilty for everything I did. It was never meant to go that far, but I now realize that my childish behavior almost cost a good man his future. I wish I could apologize to Colin in person, but I know I'll never get a chance to. Please be careful with your words, as they could ruin someone's career, life, everything. If, like me, you adore your teacher, then please just respect them, be nice, and let them be. I've never liked hospitals. Yeah, I get it, no one really does. Yet here I was, sitting in the hospital waiting area, silently praying that she would be all right. Jeez, I was shaking like an old dog left out in the cold. I just couldn't think straight. Why was no one telling me if she would be okay? Suddenly, a stern-faced doctor appeared and told me, Sir, the operation was a success. Your sister will be just fine. You can go through and see her now. I didn't know whether to burst into tears because of relief or to run away because of fear. Finally, I still went to see her. She blinked open her eyes, then fixed them on me, and in a groggy voice said, Who are you? I get it. My appearance unnerves people. I've never been a looker, and this scar sure doesn't help. But people will always judge. Maybe if they stop to talk to me, then I can tell them that I'm a military veteran who got it due to an accident during training. Training I was doing so I could fight to save their butts. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Now, talking about the girl in the hospital, let me continue my story. Well, it began with my evening shift as a delivery driver. I was humming along to the radio when this girl came out of nowhere and ran straight into the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late. I heard a thud. She was lying there all limp. It was horrible. For a moment, I thought she was dead, and I was too scared to check on her. Suddenly, a thought of abandoning her popped up in my mind. But no, I couldn't be that heartless, so I ran to check her pulse. Phew, she was still alive. I called for an ambulance and told her help was on the way. In the hospital, the doctor said she needed emergency surgery, but they had to have a relative's consent first. The girl had no ID on her or anything. What was I meant to do? I couldn't just sit there and let her die. So I blurted out, I give my permission. I'm her brother. When the girl asked me who I was, 
well, I had no idea how to reply. The doctor concluded that she must have memory loss. So, who are you? The girl asked me again. I couldn't go changing my story now, so I replied, I'm Chelvin, your brother. Oh, hi, Chelvin. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. This girl seemed so sweet. I instantly warmed to her. It's been just me and my dog Buster for I don't know how many years. Girls usually take one look at me and run away as fast as their heeled shoes can take them. But this girl wasn't looking at me like they did. The doctors asked me what her name was, so I said Alice. That was my mother's name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I'd use my savings to pay for her hospital fees. Then I visited her every day. I thought she'd ask me about her family, friends, I don't know, everything. But nope. She just liked listening to me ramble on, mainly about Buster. When she was ready to leave the hospital, I took her back to my house. I made up the spare room and bought some new bed covers, laid some clothes out on the bed, and put some flowers in there to make it look nice. Alice seemed to like it. She smiled, told me I was sweet, then hugged me. I bet I was blushing like a beetroot. I left her there to get ready. Then I made a start on dinner. She came downstairs in this dress I'd bought at the mall for her, and oh my days, she looked like a picture. I made an excuse to go and get her a drink, so she wouldn't see how flustered I was. I thought she'd ask me stuff about her life, but she didn't. Not one question. So I decided to tell her anyway. I mean, I'd spent days making the backstory up, so I may as well share it with her. It's just you and me now, and it has been that way for a long time. Our parents passed away some years ago now. Our mom, she was called Alice too. Oh, it's a nice name, she muttered back. Do I look like her? Um, yes, you have her hair. I told her a few other things, such as how she'd just broken up with her boyfriend and was in between homes at the moment. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like she was soaking my words in and taking some comfort from them. The next day, things changed, and Alice started doing erratic things. I went downstairs bright and early to find that she'd emptied all of my kitchen cupboards and was scrubbing them clean. When I asked her what she was doing, she ignored me and carried on. It's like she was in her own bubble and couldn't hear me at all. I told myself this was probably just her way of adjusting to everything. But then her odd behavior continued. When a delivery guy knocked on the door, she leaped behind the couch. Afterward, I asked her what was up. But she said she was just looking for her lost earring. Another time, I was waiting for my favorite TV show to start, and we were both chatting on the couch. But she suddenly grabbed the TV remote, turned it off, then walked out of the room with the remote. This was normal, right? She'd been through a lot. Maybe this was a stage of her recovery? Most of the time, she was such a sweet and lovely girl. She always packed food and snacks for me to take to work, and she made such a fuss of Buster. Okay, so she still did her cupboard cleaning ritual every single morning, but hey, we all have our quirks. Having another mouth to feed meant I had to work more hours, but I didn't mind it. For once, I felt like a purpose. She helped me find the reason to live again, instead of just existing. I often took her treats home, such as cookies or Hawaiian pizza, her favorites. If I was working night shifts, she always waited up for me. It made me feel so warm inside when I arrived home and saw her sitting there with Buster. I had no money left at the end of each month, but I had something more. I had happiness. I liked this girl. I more than liked her, but I couldn't tell her this, as she thought I was her brother. I knew I needed to tell her the truth but I just didn't know how to go about doing so. One morning, after she'd finished her cupboard cleaning and we were enjoying breakfast, I told her about the job I had on, delivering a parcel to Sherry Hill Street. Her eyes widened. Then she told me she wanted to come too. This was surprising, as she'd shown no interest in leaving the house before. I mean, she refused to even take Buster for a walk, but I agreed without questioning her. I told her to wait in the lorry while I delivered the parcel. Only when I got back, she wasn't there. I ran around the block searching for her. But then I saw a crowd and it seemed like there's a car accident. My face paled. I ran as fast as I could to see who the victim was and luckily it wasn't her. Phew. I kept looking around and finally I found her. She was sitting on the curb with her head in her hands. She was crying. I sat down next to her and hugged her. 
she might be too scared witnessing the terrible accident. Then, when she was ready, I took her home. The next morning, I went downstairs expecting to see her cleaning the cupboards, but she wasn't there. I made her some toast and a coffee and took them up to her room. She opened the door, glared at me, then said, I remember everything. I know you're not my brother. Alice, I'm so sorry. I just, I just wanted to help you. She shouted at me. My name's not even Alice. Then she stormed past me. I rushed after her and heard the door bang shut. She'd gone. So that's it. I was back to my lonely, sad life. Each day after work, I came home to see no one waiting for me. No hot meals, no laugh, nothing but a boring, empty house. Three months went by, and one day I was delivering some boxes to this rich shop owner guy. The boxes were very heavy, and one of them fell out of my arms and hit the floor. The shop guy started yelling at me, You idiot! I'm not paying you to be neglectful! But then what do I expect? You can't even look after your own face! I didn't say anything. Instead, I peered down at my feet. Then I heard footsteps, so I looked up, and there she was. It was Alice. Oh, no. I didn't want her to see me being scorned at like this. Suddenly, she shouted at the man. Hey, just because you have money doesn't mean you can say anything to others. Apologize to him or I will not let up on you. The man sneered and told her to go away. I couldn't deal with this, so I walked away. But Alice rushed after me and called out to me. Please, Chelvin, let me tell you the truth. I stopped walking. And that's when she told me everything. It turns out, She'd never lost her memory. She faked it because she wanted to escape her miserable life. Her husband was a cruel man who cheated on her, beat her, and controlled her. He was a famous TV presenter, which is why she turned off the TV that time, as she'd seen him on there. She hid when the doorbell rang, as she was terrified it'd be him, and she tidied the cupboard every morning out of habit, as if she didn't do it back home, he would beat her. What? This was crazy. I needed answers. So I asked her, so you faked regaining your memories? And that outburst, it was all a lie? Chelvin, I'm so sorry. I knew I couldn't drag you into my personal life anymore. I used to live in Sherry Hill Street. That's why I came with you. I found out my husband thought I was dead, so he married another woman. I made him sign the divorce papers and set me free. I also made him give me a payout, else I'd ruin his precious career. Then she handed me some money and told me it was to cover the expenses for when she was living with me, and that she'd also send me some money to cover her hospital fees. We hugged, and I cried like a baby. Gee, this was all too much for me. But then, to my surprise, she grinned, went to shake my hand, then said, Hey, I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, after that, thanks to her ex, Julia was able to buy a nice little house. Actually, I'm helping her renovate it. We've become pretty great friends. To be honest, just looking at her makes my stomach flip. I love her so much. I know I need to tell her. Life's far too short not to. If she says no, well, then at least I'll still have her friendship, right? I might not have model looks, but I'm a good person. Julia's taught me to realize that. I hope she says yes, but what will be will be. Wish me luck. Hey, Dan, how about we go to that Japanese restaurant I want to try? Um, but my mom's expecting me home for dinner, Dan awkwardly replied. Again? I rose an eyebrow. Predictably, his next move was taking out his phone and calling Mommy Dearest. Mom says eating out is very expensive. It's your idea, so you're paying, okay? Excuse me? Did I mishear him? Unbelievable. So, through gritted teeth, I said, Forget it. I'm going home. Then I left him standing there with a stupid look on his face. Yep, that idiot was my boyfriend, Dan. He's in his 20s, but every conversation is still, My mom this and my mom that. It's so exhausting. At first, I thought I'd found a manly, impeccable man to rely on. Instead, <sighs> It just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover, y'all. It all started with me coming back to the country, and it was hard finding my feet here again. Also, I hadn't had a boyfriend for, 
let's say, a long time. I wasn't that desperate, but my auntie insisted on matchmaking me with this cute guy. I thought, why not? First impressions, Dan was fine. He'd just graduated from a prestigious college, and he seemed so gentle and kind. We spent a good time chit-chatting, so yeah, after that we started dating. It was swell at first, but then the abnormal details about him began to surface. We arranged a date at mine once. The plan was to cook a meal together, then relax watching a movie. But as soon as he arrived, he walked straight over to the couch and started watching TV without any helpful intention. I dragged him into the kitchen, passed him a carrot and the peeler. He looked confused, then stuttered, Er, but I don't know how. I tried to show him, but despite explaining it in great detail, Dan still fumbled to peel one lousy carrot. Then, yep, you guessed it, at one point he called his mom. Then he told me, My mom says the kitchen is a very dangerous place. I could cut or burn myself. We could go back to my place. My mom can do the cooking. I glared at his arms akimbo. Or or we can eat out, Dan mumbled. Only if it's on you, Claire. It's not my fault. I growled while shaking my head. Fine, then I'm not coming with you. Then I pushed him out and slammed the door shut behind him. What the hell just happened? Still, I told myself that maybe he was just scared, since he has never cooked before. One time we were in a clothes shop, and I spotted this shirt that I knew would suit him. It wasn't his usual style, but I insisted he tried it on, and ooh, he looked so good in it. Dan seemed to like it too, as he admired himself in the mirror, then said, It does look nice, but wait, can you please take a photo so I can send it to my mom? Well, she's the one who buys all my clothes, so... What? So now he needed approval from his mom before he bought anything? Jeez. Anyway, I took a couple of photos and he sent them to his mom. They exchanged messages. Then he turned to me and said, Okay, mom says you can buy me it. Me? My eyes widened. Yeah, mom says you chose it, so you should buy it for me. Wait, what? I literally froze for seconds. Speechless, I could only glare at him before I found the means to leave. Claire, what's wrong? Dan chased after me, but I ignored him. Okay, I admit that after a few dates, it was easy to figure out he was a total mommy's boy. But I told myself that it was sweet he loved his mom so much, and I never expected it to be that extreme. After that, I used the silent treatment on him, but he wouldn't quit bugging me. Then, he told me he wanted to take me out to my favorite restaurant as a birthday treat. Ooh, this sounded great! Perhaps he'd realized something and wanted to make it up for me. We were holding hands and walking toward the restaurant when we passed by a shoe store, and in the window display were the perfect pair of boots. Well, I'm a girl, and it was my birthday. I pulled Dan's arm. Danny, look! I pointed at the boots. I want those. I grinned from ear to ear. Okay. Dan replied blandly. My smile faded. I mean, they'd make the best birthday present. Ugh, since when did a girl like me have to ask for a gift? Why? Dan shrugged. You like them, I don't. My face reddened with anger. But it's my birthday. Dan scratched his head and forced a smile. Sorry, babe. Last night I spent my allowance on some new games, so I'm broke now. I sneered, why don't you ask your mom? And he unexpectedly went mad. Hey, you're obviously the wealthier one. How come you keep asking me to buy you stuff? Enough! I stopped dead. I have never, ever dated anyone as awful as you before. You're a grown-ass man, so stop running to your mommy every time you forget how to turn the kettle on or stub your toe. And why on earth do you still get an allowance at your age? It's over. Then I turned to leave, without letting him have the last word. So freaking unreal. Trust me, to arrive back in the country and end up straight into this bizarre mommy's boy circumstance. But yeah, at least I was finally free of him now. It's been a few weeks since then, but just the thought of Dan still made me so mad. Ugh, I needed to get out of here and live a little. 
So I called my close friend Philip and arranged to meet him and some of my trusted guy friends at a bar. Cheer up, little girl, he teased. I know what will put a smile on your face. Our gaming group found this hilarious player. All we have to do is throw a few compliments his way, and he buys us all new items. Then, whenever we go out partying after a victory, this noob also pays for it all. What an ego. I mocked, congrats, bros. Wish my ex-date was also that generous. Then I rolled my eyes. He never spent a cent. Well, at least not without asking his mom for permission first. Philip laughed with a surprise. Hey, this noob's the same. He brags that despite being broke, his mom came up with the idea of matching him with rich girls so he can be covered. Hold up. That didn't sound right. I had a real bad feeling about this. Then Philip pointed across the bar and said, Oh, speak of the devil, and patted my back. A chill ran down my spine as I took a deep inhale of breath and turned to see it was Dan. And oh, he had a new girlfriend already. I quickly made up some excuse and bailed before they saw me. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about Dan's new girlfriend. Whatever Dan and his mom were doing was no less than scamming. So I arranged to meet up with Philip at a diner, and I confided in him about my history with Dan and how I was concerned about his new girlfriend. Philip offered to help and said he would try and find out more information. A few days later, he reported back with his findings. Turns out, Dan and his mom had learned the Claire lesson, so this time with his new girlfriend, Lizzie, they were playing it differently. Dan, as his mom had ordered, took some sensitive photos of Lizzie, and now every time she refused to pay for something, he threatened to post them online. OMG! This made me feel so sick! This poor girl was trapped and were sucked dry of all her money. This was extortion, and I was going to put a stop to it. It didn't take long for me to find Lizzie online. I then dropped her a message saying I wanted to help, and we arranged to meet up in person. After hearing me say that I knew the truth, Lizzie burst into tears. I can't let those pictures get out, so I have to keep on being his girlfriend and pay for everything. She rubbed the tears off her cheeks. I had to borrow money, and now the interest means I'm in thousands of dollars worth of debt, and I still have no guts to speak out. Let's put an end to this. I slammed my fist on the table. Be brave, Lizzie. I've got your back. The day after Philip and I went with Lizzie to tell her parents, it was bad. Her mom started blubbering and tried to cover her face while her dad went furious. No one does this to my little girl and gets away with it. Philip replied, Too right. The bad guys are going down. We spent the rest of the day gathering evidence, including all of the threatening messages Dan had sent her and the receipts she'd kept from the extortionate purchases he'd forced her to make for him. That was when Lizzie received a message from Dan. There's this expensive restaurant I want to go to. Babe, take me there tonight or else. Love you, X. Lizzie replied that she agreed. Then knowing Dan was out, we went around to his house. We confronted Dan's mom as soon as she let us inside. She was frightened and eventually confessed that she didn't have a job and it was Dan's dad who provided for them. As a result, she spoiled Dan so badly that it annoyed his dad, so he left. Then she sadly blurted out, He didn't say a word to me. He just left Dan a note that said, Take care of yourself and your mom. I knew Dan would be miserable without his luxuries, so I told him to find a rich girlfriend to spoil him and this time... She looked from me to Lizzie to make sure she would be too trapped to ever leave. There was a knock at the door. She looked at us awkwardly before she went to answer it. We followed her, and that was when we saw two cops arresting her. She bursted into tears as they took her away. I guess she thought she was a devoted mother who was doing right by her son, when, in truth, she went about it in totally the wrong way. She ended up going to jail, and her house was sold to pay off Lizzie's debts, As for mommy's boy Dan, as an accomplice, he ended up doing community restitution. Hey, this would probably do him some good, as he'd finally learn what a day's hard work actually felt like. Huh. Thankfully, Lizzie gradually got over this traumatizing event and was ready to start dating again. With Philip. Hmm. About me, well, I'm still single, but I don't feel lonely anymore, as I have awesome friends. Besides, 
This way I have no guys bumming money off me. <laughs> I was sound asleep when loud bangings jolted me awake. The cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go! Get away from me! Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ah, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Jones's mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the surfers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry and I blacked out. Out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? I, I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there was no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy a stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. 
Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from Mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down. Like some incompetence. <laughs> Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. Huh, <laughs> who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, <clears throat> it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack! His shoe was right up my face. Ouch! Get your dirty foot off me! I tried getting up, and we ended up kissing. My... My first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand? Um. Oh, sorry. It was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dash cam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. The scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. 
The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say the stock door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah, of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 Leighton shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now, this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up. But I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister, and I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me, from my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and and passed away. Don only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage, making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it? In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that, after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair on you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin, especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... 
I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both? Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six, but I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him, talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent, and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary! Diane's parents were researchers way in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect! First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This 10th contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless, grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. 
Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me? I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl, he's just so strict about things like this. You're right, Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't be wife two people at the same time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S Celine, he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the US. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm gonna do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matin, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matin listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. 
A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine, you've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind-hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot. And there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together and I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. You are watching the incredible Barry's Blue. I'm Sonya, the super talented lead vocalist, and that guy over there rocking the guitar is Eric, my boyfriend. He's also our composer and backing vocalist. Yep, my man's good at everything, just like me. Actually, he's the one who discovered my vocal talent and helped me on my road to fame. Our debut album exploded onto the charts. And the rest is history. Eric asked me to be his girlfriend right on stage after our set. I don't know who was more excited, me or my adoring fans. Everything was perfect. And then our next album flopped. I guess all that pressure had interrupted Eric's writing process. I tried to send him positive energy. 
We had a big show coming up to debut our new single and start our comeback. Who knows when the sun will rise again, right? But during our performance, as Eric stepped back to give me the spotlight, I stepped forward and suddenly slipped and fell. S Sonia, your nose! It's crooked! I was rushed into surgery, but my nose looked like a lightning bolt. I can't look like this. I must be beautiful! You'll always be the cutest girl to me. No need to worry. We can still fix it. But right after that, the photo of my busted nose hit the headlines. I got ridiculed for praising natural beauty and then getting plastic surgery. What vultures! I had to upload the video of me slipping to end these rumors, but they claimed I did it on purpose to get attention. What on earth? We thought all that drama was finally over, but no. Right when my nose healed, my chubby pre-puberty secondary school photo appeared all over the internet, which sparked rumors about me having my whole body reconstructed. Some anonymous posts even made up that I was hot-tempered and snooty to band crew and waiting staff. I mean, maybe I could be a bit abrupt, but I was famous, so I was allowed to get what I wanted. Then, Let's Cancel Sonya began to circulate. Do these tragic people have nothing better to do than gossip about me? But my fans took notice, and a load of our tour tickets got cancelled. My manager freaked out and made me go on leave until the rumors died down. How ridiculous! Worse still, they were actually going to try to replace me? The beautiful, one-of-a-kind lead vocalist? How dare they do this to me? I am the band! Hang in there, babe. I promise I'll find a way to get you back. Obviously, my photos didn't leak themselves. Some jerk did this, and it's now my life mission to track them down and make them pay. Okay, so from my internet searching, I traced the original rumor to this group of my anti-fans. Can you believe they actually met up at this cafe once a month just to badmouth me? They even had a schedule. How ridiculous! What had I ever done to them? Disguising myself, I showed up to find out more clues. Hmm, inside were those terrible leaked pictures of me. Jeez, these people clearly had way too much time on their hands. Wait, this guy looks familiar. Is he... Owen? My high school crush? He was my senior in the music club and a super talented singer, guitarist, and composer. But how come he's my anti-fan? I never even spoke to him. The group buzzed about how pretentious I am. They even said Eric and I were fake dating just to cover up the news about our latest album flop. Ahem. Obviously, our love is real. I never tire of hearing trash talking about that Eric guy's songs, but it's closing time. If you posted about Barry's Blue, please claim your money from the counter before leaving. What? Owen actually paid them to slander my band? Why was he so intent on ruining my career? Did he have a personal vendetta against me? I just had to find my own way to figure all this out. Making myself one of them should do it. I immediately called to apply for the job, and I got it. Showtime! It's important to look the part, so I dressed up as this innocent-looking girl for my first shift. Thanks to the magic of makeup, even I could hardly recognize myself. Call me Summer from now on. After the introduction, Owen immediately gave me tons of work. I had to do the heavy lifting and stinky, dirty work. I was a pampered star, not a grunt. Ugh, he's such an exploitive boss. I must have been crazy to have ever crushed on him. In the evening, the anti-fan group showed up again, followed by a familiar face. It's Rena? Owen's little sister. Back in high school, she was quite arrogant. It seemed like nothing had changed. Did you know that Sonya was such a weirdo in high school? Now that she's famous, she's acting like she's above everyone else. Stop right there, carrot hair. What's your name? Um, I'm Summer? So, Summer, here we've got a special requirement for every newbie. You have to pass the anti-fan test. Tell us, what do you think's the most irritating thing about Sonya? Ugh, now I have to defame myself? Actually, I was Sonya's childhood friend. Well, just a neighbor. She was the worst kid in the neighborhood. What did Sonya look like when she was young? And how was her personality? She was chubby and cruel to other kids. She threw bugs at them and never shared her toys. Take notes, guys. Remember to cite the source as Sonya's close neighbor. You can get some bonus, too, for contributing useful information like this. Was Rena also involved in this, along with her brother? When Rena left, the other anti-fans Caleb, Violet, and June still didn't leave, but turned to the stage and started tuning the instruments? What? 
they've composed a whole song to mock me, not only about my surgery rumors, but also that I was a vain, hot-tempered, competitive, talentless, disrespectful, and never used my abundant money to help others. Her music was good, but the insolence killed their skills. I'm curious, why do people hate Sonya that much? She's rude and her music sucks. Yeah, her natural voice is good, but it doesn't have any emotions. She probably doesn't know anything about love and doesn't have any friends either. Those comments from the anti-fans got me thinking. I suppose I do find it hard to open up to people, and I can be a bit hot-headed sometimes, but am I really that unlikable? Ugh, not the nose again, please! Huh? Owen? First you break the cups, now you're wasting sugar. Sugar? Seriously? Aren't you even going to ask if I'm hurt? If I leave here with just a scratch, this place will be finished, you know. This place was fine until you showed up. At least, Summer, you should learn how to apologize and thank. Suddenly, the anti-fan's words echoed in my head. As Summer, Owen still saw how much of a diva I was. That means, as Sonya, I must have been so despicable. Um, I'm sorry. I should have thanked you for helping me. Hmm, that's okay. I'm glad you're not hurt. Don't forget Rena's reward at the counter. Take it before you go. Why do you have to pay others to badmouth Sonya? I'm only going along with all this for my sister, but it brings more customers in, so whatever. So the person behind this is Rena? I don't think so. Someone must be pulling her strings. But who? I don't know. Why are you so concerned, Summer? I was just curious. <laughs> I used to think badly about Owen, but beneath his cold front, he's kind of sweet and caring just like years ago. I was trying to escape the rain and bumped into him. He saved me from falling, didn't care how sweaty I was, and even gave me his umbrella. But in front of my crush, I was too shy and embarrassed to say anything and hurried off. Since then, I didn't feel so uncomfortable hearing the anti-fans slate me and our band's decline. It was almost all true anyway. At least this way, I could learn from my past mistakes and become a way better person. Flowers grow in the strangest of places, right? Yeah. These anti-fans actually became my friends. Playing with them was way more fun than with the berries somehow. Okay guys, you need to share your music with the world. So, I signed up our budding band for a local music competition. Well, what? But we're not professionals. Do you really think we can win? Who cares? I always wanted to perform on a big stage, but what are we gonna play? Use one of my songs if you want. I hear the payout is pretty good. Ooh, I love your songs. We practiced together every night, and everyone was so focused on this, they didn't post bad rumors about me anymore. Owen is truly a genius. Listening to him playing his intros always gave me goosebumps. And so, the image of a cute, talented Owen reappeared in my mind. Oh no, wake up, Sonya, you already have a boyfriend! Eric? Speaking of Eric, he's been ignoring all of my calls. I get it, he's busy rehearsing for the show, but didn't he promise to find a way to bring me back? Oh! I see. You're too busy playing bands to post anything. We have a show this weekend. You started this, didn't you, Summer? I knew you were trouble from the beginning. Get out of here. I'm on her side. Are you going to kick me out too? Don't you see I'm doing this for you? Did you forget that Eric stole your songs and used them for his debut album? Rena, don't you think I already know what you're up to? You and that Eric guy are seeing each other, right? Doesn't he want you to spread rumors so he can replace Sonya, his current girlfriend? He says if I succeed, her place in the band will be mine. An affair is one thing, but he can't help you shine with that tuneless music. That's why I need your songs! Owen, just give me a few and everything will go smoothly. At that moment, it all became clear. The only album that made a name for the Berries was actually stolen. And worse still, the person behind my plummeting career was my own boyfriend. That jerk Eric craves fame and would never let himself get caught up in a love triangle scandal. You know how important public opinion is to him. He's using you and as soon as you give him what he wants, he'll drop you without a thought. I'm not that easily replaceable. What do you mean, Summer? I'm sorry for lying about who I really am, but not everything is fake. I wish you could feel it. Pass my words to him. I'm out. And you, Rena? That jerk doesn't deserve any of our love or trust. Even if I didn't want to go back to being the famous Sonya, I couldn't continue to be the carefree Summer either. I didn't realize they were there. They must have heard everything. You're Sonya? Not Summer? All this time? You lied to us! I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you or trick you. Your words made me want to change myself for the better. And your music taught and inspired me a lot. Caleb, 
Violet, June, I just want to be friends with you. Who wants to be your friend, you liar? I may have found out the truth about myself and Eric, but now I've lost my career, my friends, my boss, everything. I made such a mess of everything, and I didn't know how to fix it. I don't deserve to be Sonya, or even Summer. It must be a delivery guy. I barely had the energy to get up and open the door. Standing in front of me was... Owen? Did he come all the way here just to see me? Some... Sonya, I've been thinking a lot about your band and Eric, and... I realized that this isn't your fault. You can't let Eric win. You're too talented for that. If you show everyone your true self, I just know they'll love you. Actually, there's one thing I want to confess to you. I used to have a crush on you in high school, but you probably didn't even know I existed. Really? That's so dumb. What do you mean? Actually, at that time I liked you too. You were so cute and shy with that beautiful voice, but when I came closer to talk to you, you just ran away. If I had been more confident and braver, maybe we could have become something different. What about now? I mean, do you still want to sing my song? It'll be an honor. Your song is always special. Owen pulled me to the competition and tenderly strapped the bass on for me. Going out there without the rest of the band seemed terrifying, but we couldn't give up. Owen was about to lead me on stage when Rena rushed over to us and grabbed my arm. Sonia, I messed up. It's true that Eric was using me, and I had been so blind to trust him that much. I've corrected the misinformation about you. I was hugging her when the rest of the anti-fans appeared. I apologized to them how I was now a better version of myself because of them. Turns out we really like Summer, so we forgive you. Now we're ready to rock the night. You can't sing with them, Sonya. That song is supposed to be the theme song in our next album. Eric, it's Owen's song, not yours. And didn't Rena tell you that I no longer give a damn about your band? I did. Seems he wasn't listening. We've published your dirty plan all over the forums, so everyone can see what a jerk you are. No, you have to come with me. Tell them you made it all up. Leave her alone. I won't let you take anything from me again. My song or my girl. She's our friend now, so excuse us. We need to get on stage and perform our song. I can't believe I'm back on stage again. Only this time, it's so much better. My bandmates are awesome. The song is amazing, and the crowd is going wild. I saw Eric shamefully disappear through the crowd. Tough luck. That's what being a big slimy liar gets you. Toward the end of the song, Owen pulled me close to him and the crowd went silent. All I could hear was the beating of my heart when he gave me the best kiss ever. Hi, I'm Kaylee from Washington. I might dress like a boy, but I'm actually the girliest girl you could ever meet. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I was born with shiny blonde hair and blue eyes, just like my mom. I never met my dad, but it wasn't really a big deal. There's no need to live in some fancy castle to feel like a princess. I was already one in my mom's eyes. She always pampered me with the cutest things in the world. You could give Rapunzel a run for her money, sweetheart. But tragically, mom left me in an accident when I was 10, and I had to move in with Selena, my mom's friend. She lived in a mansion where there were so many people dressed just like her. As soon as they saw me, they started to ooh and ah at me. What a porcelain doll. Bet she'll win any beauty pageants. She's just too lovely to be real. Shh, Miss Sanchez here doesn't like anyone who's prettier than her daughter. Yeah, she's been in a foul mood ever since the master left for his mistress. I only caught a bit of what they said before Selena dragged me into a corner. Sweetie, you heard them. Boys are bad news. Just look at your dad, for example. So stay away from them. Got it? Um... And the only way to repel them is if you look more like them. Then she told me to wear contact lenses to hide my blue eyes, cut my long locks, threw away my dress collection, and bought me clothes that basically drowned me. And voila, I look just like a teenage boy. One day, I was alone in the kitchen when I heard someone shouting, Bring me two smoothies now! I brought in two avocado shakes, but accidentally splashed one all over this girl's face, turning her into Shrek. Watch what you're doing! My daughter's angel face is destined to be Miss USA! How dare you! I, I'm i sorry, ma'am. Relax, mom. Avocado face masks are all the rage anyway. Sadly, I still had to take my punishment, but suddenly the girl walked towards me. Hey, I'm Beatrix. Let's go and play. But I'm... Don't worry, I'm here. My mom won't punish you anymore. 
Then, she took me to her room. Wow, she even has a castle inside? Beatrix then put some wigs and makeup on me. I looked at myself in the mirror, and memories of my mom came rushing back. I quickly pulled out the photo of her that I carried with me all the time. We looked so alike. I was about to take my lenses out, but Selena stormed in and dragged me back to my room. Don't you ever let me catch you here again, and keep your distance from Little Mistress. We're not from the same world as people like them. Remember that? But little did Selena know, Beatrix had just asked her mom to allow me to go to school with her. And ever since then, we've been literally inseparable. I mean, literally. She clung to me from living room to kitchen, from home to school. Honestly, the only time I could have a moment of peace was when I went to the restroom. Phew. Oh, maybe not. And each time we hung out was more than torture. I had to fight against the urge to act girly, hit my own hands whenever they started to reach for those pretty things, and now they ended up swollen. Think I'll glue them in my pockets next time. Then, one day, I arrived at school to the most terrible news ever. Kaylee, one of our female rugby players got injured, so I put you on the team. What on earth? I don't even know what rugby is. Here's Austin, your rugby coach. If you need anything, he's your guy. You know him? He might be handsome, but something about him screams bad news. People call him Awful Austin. You better watch out. And she wasn't exaggerating at all. On the very first day, he already pushed me to my absolute limits in training, but I almost passed out. In the agility ladder exercises, I got my feet tangled up in the line and fell to the ground. But instead of a hand, all I got was his soulless look. Then one time, I missed the ball, causing it to hit another player. Hey, is this a joke to you? Do it properly. Keeping all Celine's words in mind, I zipped my mouth up and ignored him, who was definitely a boy. Oi, what's the attitude? You're bringing the whole team down. See? Cat got your tongue? Faking dumb doesn't work here. From tomorrow, extra training. No excuses. Beatrix was right. He was a devil. I was dragging my aching body home after training when I noticed a cute cat and stopped to pet it. The cat ran away, so I followed it and ended up at the back gate of the school, which was totally off limits. I've never been here before. Whoa, look at this beautiful mural. It's so mesmerizing. What you doing here? Awful Austin? Uh, um, I just... Anyway, did you paint this? It's amazing. Of course not. Stop crying. He was such a terrible liar. But to be honest, I didn't expect some jock like him to be interested in art, let alone actually be good at it. What are you two doing here? Don't move! Oh no, the guard has spotted us! Austin immediately grabbed my hands and started running. We hid in a small alley, and he pressed me against the wall with his strong arms. My heart was racing like crazy, and I could feel his too. We were so close that our faces were only inches apart, and the warmth of his breath made me blush even more, so I accidentally let out a squeal. Thankfully, before things could get any more awkward, the guard was gone. Don't even think of breathing a single word about this. Weirdly, this time his words didn't hurt at all. Maybe because I knew, beneath his tough jock exterior, he had his own secret, just like me. I like your painting, so no need to hide it. Austin stopped for a bit, then kept walking, but I'm sure I caught a smile. After that day, he started to behave quite differently, more gently. He no longer went berserk at me, but helped me get through the training instead so I could catch up with the other players. I just had my first successful kick. Yay! I turned around to cheer with Austin, but out of nowhere, the ball came hurtling right at me, and he instantly caught it with one hand, while the other held me by the waist. Okay, that was awkward. This week, there'd be a senior prom at school, and Beatrix insisted we go. Of course, I gave her a no, but she was literally a leech, so I had no other choice. Wear this, Kay. It's a matching set. It'll be so lame if I wear this alone, please. Fine, but only because you've given me no choice. Yay, love ya. Eek. Wow, it smelled so good. What if I put it on? But wait, what about Selena? Forget it. It's not like she'll be at the prom. YOLO. I stepped into the ballroom with this gorgeous outfit on, my blue eyes, and the necklace my mom gave me. Everyone jaw dropped as soon as they saw me, and that's when I noticed Austin coming towards me. Hey, you look different tonight. Uh, I mean in a good way. Wanna dance? Sorry, girls time. Kaylee, look at the tasty food corner. Told you we had to come here. 
Oh, Beatrix, my friend here is starving. Can you show him where to grab a bite? Wow, sure, handsome. We have cupcakes, biscuits, uh, and even brownies. Isn't this called choosing boys over friends? <laughs> Good for her, anyway. <laughs> Then Austin gently led me in the waltz. He looked exactly like a prince from a fairy tale. As we fell in step, letting the rhythm control our movements, I felt my whole body tingle. The sparks were definitely flying, but suddenly the music changed into trance. We looked into each other's eyes for a second, then hand in hand ran across the crowd until we got outside. I could never imagine a tomboy could become like this. Actually, I'm not a tomboy. What do you mean? That's when I decided to tell him everything about how I was obsessed with girly things, but had to suppress it all my life. It felt so good to let it all out after burying it the whole time. And Austin was such a good listener. Wow, Kaylee, I'm so sorry. Actually, I've also had to hide my passion for arts to help my father's business too. So what you said to me the other day really opened up something in me. So things were not easy for him either, huh? Suddenly, he pulled out a sketchbook and started drawing me. I wish this moment would last forever. His face then went all serious, but not in a cold way as usual, but instead beaming with passion. Our eyes met, and I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. And yes, I hoped this moment would last forever too. Then suddenly, he leaned closer to fix my hair. I was ready for a kiss. Then, Kaylee! Selena, how did she find out about this? Man, you know what's coming next. I can't believe you'd be this reckless! You're not my mom! And not every boy is like my dad, you were wrong! Mind your manners! Get changed! Now! Right then, Mrs. Sanchez came to interrupt us. Hang on, are her eyes blue? And what's this? Uh, um, don't mind her. I bought this half price at the swap meet, ma'am. Then she signaled for me to flee the scene. If mom were here, she'd understand the way I feel. Blinking back tears, I suddenly felt a warm hand on my shoulder. Are you alright? I saw you leave with Austin. Did he cut your hair? It looks shorter. I'm okay, Beatrix. Oh wow, I have a similar necklace that my dad gave to me. This was from my dad too, except that I don't actually know who he is. Maybe your dad is my dad? <laughs> Zero for the joke, Beatrix. Oh, but why did Selena lie about the necklace to Miss Sanchez? So I went to find Selena right after, and she told me the most shocking thing ever. Beatrix's dad, the former master here, was actually my dad. He seduced mom, who used to be a maid here too. When Mrs. Sanchez found out, both of them were kicked out of the house. Then knowing mom was having me, he dumped her right away. Selena was afraid Mrs. Sanchez could see mom in me, and so she had to force me to disguise myself. Wow, this was seriously messed up. Keep your identity a secret by all means or we're doomed. Understand? I was in complete shock, but I knew I had to be more careful from then on. For the whole week after, Mrs. Sanchez seemed to be in a good mood. One day, she even asked me to go shopping with her. But a wedding dress studio? Is there a wedding coming, ma'am? Yes, and it's yours, you filth. You have to pay for your mom's karma for stealing my husband. So she knew everything? I tried to bolt away, but immediately got caught. Then she took me to this luxurious house, and guess who I met? Kaylee, what are you doing here? Uh, Austin? Wh what? What do you want? I was still bewildered when a man pushed a boy in a wheelchair into the living room. Hi, Mr. Fisher, about our arrangement. This is the bride here. She and Ivan here will make the perfect couple. Hope you like this gift as my thanks for your favor. My blessings for the marriage and your family. Dad, what is she talking about? Ivan will get married to this girl. I've already settled everything so that Ivan can have a bright future without worrying about anything. Excuse me? I've had to put aside my art dream to enroll in business school, as you wished, and now you want to control my brother's life too? I object to this marriage, because I love her! Then he pulled me away, leaving Mr. Fisher frozen in shock. Kaylee, I'm so sorry you had to meet my dad in such an awful way. I promise to never let anyone treat you like this again. No worries, I have to thank you instead. Your words really woke up the courage in me. Austin offered to help me talk things out, but it's time for me to fight for my own good. I came back home to see Mrs. Sanchez flying into a rage. How dare you bring your face back into this house! You cruel woman! I will not marry someone else just to pay off your debt! Right at that moment, Selena walked in, and she literally turned into a bull. How dare you do that to my child! I had to stop her from lunging towards Mrs. Sanchez. 
So how about what you all have done to me? Do you know what I've been through all these years? Her mom stole my husband, and you just expect me to put it aside? Then, she collapsed and burst into tears. Suddenly, I felt bad for her. I'm sorry for everything that happened to you, but it doesn't mean you have to punish yourself with it or grant yourself the right to dictate others like that. She owes you nothing, and you have no right to control others' lives. Right after that, Selena and I packed our stuff and left the house. Walking through that door, we felt more free than ever before. After all that drama, it took us some time to get our lives back on track. From all the money Selena had saved working as a maid, she was able to open her own bakery and take back control of our lives. And so do I. Finally, I'm back to my princess style. But after all those craziest things happened, something never changed. Oh my god, oh my god, we're half sisters! Yay! Ah, uh, my mom said she felt so guilty about what happened, but asked me to keep it a secret. Oops. And about that guy, you ask? He worked things out with his dad. And guess what? He's in art school now. Okay, now tilt your head to the right. Yeah, like that. Gosh, that dress makes you look like a fairy princess. Who dare to make a princess stay still like a statue for more than one hour? Huh? The charming artist? Shh, it's almost done. I beg your pardon. Finally, I'm out of that morbid place. Now let me tell you, sharing a cell with a dozen other noisy, stinky, grumpy dudes ain't fun. Anyway, here I am. Free as a bird now. Hmm. So no one's here to pick me up. Suppose I'd have to call mom. It took me a few seconds to familiarize myself with my phone. Jeez. It'd been four years. It was a miracle I hadn't turned into one of those leg-cradling crazy dudes. How I ended up in there in the first place was a joke. All I did was take some stuff from one or two warehouses and sell them on. No big deal. Yo, Mom, it's your boy, Cole. I'm out, and yeah, I need to lift home. I spoke the moment I heard Mom's voice. Cole, oh, I... Do you have any idea what hell your actions have put your mother through? My dad was so good at overreacting, but I needed somewhere to stay, so I could handle him. But Dad, Mom, come on, I'm still your son. You have the heart to see me homeless and sleeping next to rats? There was a brief pause. Then Dad grunted, You can stay for a few weeks, but only for your mother's sake. Thanks, Dad. You're the man. Bingo. My parents were like putty in my hands. This was the life. I played video games all day, then partied all night. Then one night, I was getting ready to meet my friend Moose, when Mom told me that the pizza delivery guy was at the door. I shouted down to her, you can shout me this one, and I'll get the next. I finished getting ready, and I must say, I was looking smooth. I strode down into the kitchen and grabbed a slice of pizza. Dad was sitting there glaring at me over his report. If you can't afford to pay for items, then I suggest you don't order them. He looked at the pizza slice in my hand. Mom walked up behind him and placed her hands on his shoulders. Darling, give him some more time. He's still adjusting to outside life. Thanks, Mom. You're the greatest. I gave her a greasy pizza kiss on the cheek. Um, any chance you can lend me some dough? Dad shook his head and sighed, while Mom went over to her purse and passed me some money. Hey, there'd be plenty of time to get a job and be responsible. Right now, I had four years of lost time to make up for. Once, I borrowed Dad's car. I swear I only had a couple of beers, but the world glitched out and went all blurry. The next thing I know... I'd driven straight into the neighbor's front yard. Oops. I opened my eyes the next morning to a killer headache. So all I wanted was some black coffee and a plate full of bacon. But I got Dad's death stare instead. Just when I think you can't get any more irresponsible, you took my car without asking, drank too much, then drove into Gloria's beloved rose bushes. Chill out, Dad. I'll fix it later. I said as I raided the fridge for food. You're not the one having to pay for the damages. We've made our decision. You have one week to get out of our house. Now hold up. I had zero places to go. I couldn't stay with Moose, as he was crashing in his sister's garage. And I didn't know anyone else. How could they? Ugh, sc I gotta chill a bit. So I pulled out my phone and started scrolling through dating apps. Then I matched with this stunning blonde called Trudy. 
She's a little older than me, but her family is rolling in dough. And also, she has her own business. Not only that, but she's hotter than an agitated dragon. So yeah, her photos seemed a little grainy, but guess the retro trend was in. Looks like I had it both ways, love and money. I have quite a face. But since I love beer and pizza, and without any dedication for the gym, I don't have the perfect body. But I needed to keep this girl interested. So I told her I was a tall dude with an impressive six-pack, who just graduated and was on the lookout for a girl with brains as well as beauty. This girl was actually pretty easy to talk to. She sent me pictures of her latest purchases, like phones, expensive watches, and designer clothes, along with the promise that when we started dating in person, she'd buy me whatever I wanted. Result. After four days of face pics and my priceless conversation, Trudy was smitten. And she sent me a message saying, Cole, I haven't known you long, but I know how I feel. I love you. X. Okay, that's really fast, but yeah, I've won the lottery over here. Hey, maybe she lied about her look too, but it didn't matter. She's rich. So I replied to her, I know, babes. I feel it too. X. We immediately arranged to meet in person and decided on a yellow dress code. I looked around the park trying to spot this gold mine, but all I could see was some old lady in a yellow dress. Okay, coincident, but why is she heading my way? The closer she got toward me, the wider her grin was. Cole, right? It's me, Trudy. What? No, 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 no. How come this corny, overweight, wrinkly old lady be Trudy? I was expecting the blonde beauty from the photos, not Big Bird. Once I got over the initial shock, we sat down and talked. Turns out my dream girl was in her 50s. All the descriptions and photos of her were true, but 30 years ago. She was clearly in the middle of a midlife crisis or something. You're not the same either, she sneered. You're barely taller than me. And where's the gym body? All right, fair enough. I fake smiled. Yeah, despite you looking different, I still find you very beautiful. That night, I tossed and turned. This was all so unexpected. Trudy was totally not my type. But dating her might not hurt. She was rich. And also, I had to move out tomorrow. So at least she'd pay for me. With that, I sent her a message. Babe, you're beautiful and I want to make us official. X. The next day, I moved in with Trudy. Now let me tell you something, her apartment was lavish. It was full of the latest tech. Crazy. Seeing as she was so old, she probably didn't know how to use them. She worked a lot, so most of the time I was home alone. And I was free to watch cartoons and movies, munch on potato chips, and play as many video games as I felt like. One time, I was watching a movie when the door opened. And in stepped this glary-eyed dude. I shouted at him, Hey dude! You have the wrong apartment. He tutted and said, <laughs> I can assure you that I don't. I'm Alex, Trudy's son, and you must be Cole. I would say it's a pleasure to meet my mother's gold-digging boyfriend in the flesh, but unfortunately, it's not. What? Trudy has a son? And by the looks, he's even older than me. And how dare he called me a gold digger? I suppose I was, but still, he had no right to call me it. Even worse, he refused to leave. He just sat in the kitchen and waited for his mom to return. Then he had a heated argument with her in which he referred to me as a loser and a bum. Things weren't any better with my parents either. Dad told me to be independent and get a real job, not a sugar mama. And mom was just crying. Psh, whatever. This was their fault for kicking me out in the first place. What did they expect me to do? Live under a bridge? Few days after I met Alex... Trudy insisted on dragging me along to his lame work launch thing. As soon as I got there, I went straight to the food. I was stuffing a mini quiche into my mouth when this girl walked up alongside me and said, <laughs> Great minds think alike. I gave her a gormless look. Then she pointed at the food. We both headed straight for the food. I laughed at that. <laughs> this girl was funny. And hot. Really hot. Her name is Beatrice, and she works for that loser, Alex. After that, I started seeing a lot more of this Beatrice girl, as she often popped over with Alex. And while he was arguing with his mom, usually about me, I chatted to her. That was how I found out she wasn't having it easy either. She was behind on her rent, 
because her truant brother had stolen the money and spent it all. I felt bad for her, so I took the envelope full of cash that Trudy had given to me, and I handed it to her. Okay, so I wouldn't be able to buy anything new for a few weeks, but it was worth it just to know that she'd be okay. Truth was, I was really falling for Beatrice, but I couldn't do anything about it, as I was with Trudy, and I was relying on her handouts. Soon, things became stinky. I came out of the shower to see Trudy standing there with my phone in her hand. How could you? She threw it at me. Yeah, so she'd read all of the messages I'd sent to Moose, saying how I didn't find her remotely attractive and I was only with her for a free ride. Trudes, my babes, come on, those messages were just me joking. I laughed. I was just messing around. Shut up, you liar. You find me hideous. Alex was right. You were only using me for my money. And worse, you never went to college. Instead, you were in jail. I was about to lay on the coal charm when Alex and Beatrice bursted into the room. Alex shouted at me. How low life you are. What a shameless gold digger. <laughs> it's appalling. I've told her to report you to the cops. Beatrice interrupted. No, don't do that. What Cole did was wrong, but he's not all that bad. Please. I was so moved. Took a look around. Trudy was crying. Alex was so furious his eyes were bulging. And Beatrice, well, she just looked disappointed. I then packed my stuff and left in shame. Well, that was a few months ago, and I have a decent job now. Even though I live back at home, I pay my way, and I'm saving up to put a deposit down on my own place. I never should have used Trudy like that. She might be old, but she still has feelings, and the way I treated her wasn't right. I was undeniably a douchebag back then. All I want is to have a happy life with Beatrice. I really love her, which is why I asked her to be my girlfriend, but she rejected me. Man, it stung, but... I'm not giving up. Perhaps she might give me a chance once she sees I've changed. I can't fix the past. All I can do now is improve myself and keep on rolling forward. Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were gonna be best of friends. We love all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again, right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here! Finally, we've reunited after two years! Layla, I missed you too! I- Oh, you look different. 
the girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up. Our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department. Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh, rude. Whatever. I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kind of new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh, you've got games, girl. Want to join our department? The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be soccer shots enhanced? I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal. Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall. Thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave, but on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I... I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks! Stop talking with our new member! Poof, are you sure? This morning she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this! What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fist fight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes, both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. 
First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly Marshall's phone rang and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla, my friend Layla. So the Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now. It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw oh, man, bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia, you can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was gonna help me. He wrapped his arms around me, and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better, so I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? 
I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world, and real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that, and I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally! Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear! Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes, at least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us, and the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth. Now, fine. So a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model, but somehow it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab trying to take away all of your research, but suddenly my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest. Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to, otherwise the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's been a busy day at the salon. What can I say? It's all thanks to my top-notch hairstyling talent. Ta-da! What did you do to my hair? Platinum blonde is the current trend, ma'am. I, I asked for brown! How can I go to school looking like this? Ugh, she has no eye for beauty. <sighs> but, oh no. This dumb machine? <sighs> At least it's not completely burned. Were you dosing off while cutting my hair? Give us our money back now! Money? I've only worked here for a week. How am I supposed to pay them back? Ask my parents? No way. I, the beautiful Olivia, had declared in front of them that I hated school and would build my own career through my passion for hairstyling. Not with any of those boring books. So, I left my hometown and got a job at this fancy hair salon in the big city. I would prove to my parents that I could actually earn money with my talent. Ugh, but now my boss was going berserk at me. Oh, dearie me. There's no need to make a fuss over such a measly amount of money. I shall pay for it on her behalf. I turned around and wow, it was this graceful looking middle-aged woman. Her outfit, hairstyle, and manners all screamed 
supreme elegance and luxury. Pretty girl, I can see that you have a keen eye for beauty. The only thing you're missing is an experienced mentor's guidance. And I happen to know someone. I can't believe it. Mr. Fullington, the world's number one hairstylist, was going to be my mentor. Of course, it's all thanks to this awesome lady. Oh, wait. Mom. I should call her mom now, as she's just adopted me. She must have taken a liking to me, seeing how determined I was, pursuing my passion despite all hardship. She and her husband are millionaires, who couldn't have children, so, yeah, they decided to take me in. Man, this is the best thing to happen to me ever! Olivia, school isn't the only way to success. With your talent, the road can be much shorter. My foster parents are so kind. Just look at this room! I feel like a princess. Just look at this gigantic bed, satin sheets, and walk-in closet. Better still, they even arranged for a makeup artist and a stylist to spend all day helping me look fabulous. The rich kid's life sure was sweet. I was so immersed in all of it that I almost forgot the main reason why I agreed to do this. The hairstyling course with Mr. Fullington. Mom, Dad, I know that you're both very busy, but I've been waiting so long. Has Mr. Fullington forgot about our appointment? Oh, sweetie, I'm sorry, but he's been sick, so his schedule has all been put off till next month. Don't worry, darling. In the meantime, why don't you try attending some fancy parties on our behalf? It's a good chance to expand your social circle and learn how to make money from all the best. Oh, that sounds pretty good. If I could make lots of money, then my parents would have to take me seriously and stop their stupid go-back-to-school demands. As soon as I arrived at the party, all these new friends gathered around and complimented on how beautiful I looked. The rich guys went crazy for me too. I instantly became the center of attention. This one guy called Bruce introduced himself as the son of the CEO to the top media corporation in the US. Olivia, that exquisite face of yours was made for the big screen. You should play the leading role in our new movie. Oh, acting? I'd never thought about it before. Hmm. Walking down the red carpet and posing in front of hundreds of cameras did sound appealing. It's worth a try, right? I was still stunned at Bruce's offer when I felt something cool on my finger. Oh my gosh, a sparkly red diamond ring? William, heir to the GeoGems Limited, pleasure to meet you, Olivia. Please consider this my greeting gift. And this continued all evening, until I couldn't hold any more stuff. Flowers from Justin, a jewelry set from Andrew, a perfume collection from Antony, and this watch from… geez, I couldn't remember anymore. I was trying to slip away when a handsome guy blocked me. You're stunning, Olivia. Can I see you tomorrow? A date? I didn't even know him. No, no. What a pity. I'm meeting my old friends at West High tomorrow. Sorry, it's not that I'm picky or anything. But dating can't be that easy, right? Phew, finally home. What an eventful evening. Just then, I got a call from Minnie, my best friend. Minnie told me that some mean girls at school were spreading rumors that I stole money from my parents, then packed up and ran away. Okay then, let them tittle-tattle. Tomorrow, I'll show those meanies who's the real deal. Yay, it's so nice to see Minnie again. We immediately chatted non-stop about all kinds of things. Then suddenly, the hyenas appeared with the same sarcastic tone as usual. Wow, counterfeit goods are so well made these days. You know, your supposedly Birkin bag is extremely rare. There's only five of those on Earth, right? Busted! How much do supercar hourly rentals and bodyguards cost nowadays, little miss show-off? Minnie was going to defend me, but I stopped her. No need to waste time arguing with these people. <laughs> I then grasped Minnie's hand to leave, but look, Olivia! I looked up. There was an airplane flying at very close range, and it was writing something? O L I V. The white smoke actually spelled out m my name! I've only seen this in movies! I gasped in shock as the plane landed, and stepping out of the cockpit was the guy at the party last night, Nathan. Turns out, he was the youngest pilot in America and wanted to impress me with this grand gesture after being rejected yesterday. Flying in the sky is my passion. And, Olivia, I want to be your personal pilot, taking you wherever you want. Oh my goodness, I don't know what was better. 
having a rich, handsome guy going out of his way to impress me, or seeing the astonished looks on my fake friends' faces. <sighs> Such thrilling days like this should have made me happy, right? But sitting among this mountain of expensive gifts, I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. Being the center of smitten eyes and receiving countless compliments and gifts was cool and all, but Minnie's words awakened me. Olivia, do you think they really are generous enough to give you all this without asking for anything in return? No, I shouldn't accept these pricey items. I was putting them all back in their boxes to return them when my foster mom walked in. Oh no, darling. Returning gifts is considered very insulting in our society. <sighs> The world of the rich is so complicated. So I listened to her and dismissed the idea of returning those presents. But I should still return the favor, right? So I agreed to meet some of them. The first person must be the one who impressed me the most, Nathan the pilot. His airplane hangar was where we had our first date. I couldn't find anything bad about Nathan, but we just didn't click. He kept on rambling about planes which model each was, how hard it was for him to get them, blah, blah, blah. Well, I had no interest in any of this. The next guy, William, was even worse. He not only invited me, but also dozens of other beautiful girls. He even gave each girl a gemstone from his collection. A true player, so obviously a skip. Bruce was easier to talk to, but I soon realized that he had a problem. This set of glassware was custom made by the most skillful craftsman in Switzerland. It's yours if you like. Oh, wait, I'll have someone bring them over later. Look at this beautiful painting. Wouldn't it be perfect in your bedroom? Ah, but it's too big for you to carry home. I'll send it over later. What about my leading role in the movie you mentioned? <laughs> I almost forgot. But Olivia, acting is not as easy as you think. Besides, the entertainment industry is really toxic. Please just be my princess, okay? See? He kept promising me the world and then... nothing. What a boastful, stingy liar! I didn't like any of these guys, so I must return their expensive gifts. But as soon as I carried the boxes out of the room, my foster mom stopped me. My silly Olivia, why are you so concerned about this? To them, these things are merely a drop in the ocean. But if you feel uncomfortable, I'll keep them out of sight for you. Giving them back will bring shame to our family. And you don't want that, do you? All right, that seemed like the best solution. My foster parents had been so nice to me, I shouldn't cause them any trouble. But a few days later, I discovered that they had secretly used my phone to ask Bruce for more presents. He thought I was angry, so he promised me a huge surprise tomorrow. It's weird. Why did they do that? They're as rich as Bruce's family, aren't they? I asked them why, and turned out my foster parents just wanted to test Bruce as he seemed to be the most persistent in pursuing me, but had not shown his sincerity. Early next morning, I received a call from Bruce, saying that he'd sent someone over with a luxurious car, and reminded me about our date tonight. Wait, an entire car? That's too much this time! I was about to tell him to keep it when my foster father rushed in, saying that my parents were seriously ill. Oh gosh. I quickly hung up the phone and immediately went back to my hometown. Dear God, please protect my parents. Surprisingly, my mom opened the door looking perfectly fine, and there was dad as healthy as can be watching TV. Ah, <sighs> thank goodness. My foster dad must have made a mistake. It's been a while since I was home, so I decided to stay the night. And as we were having some family time, I got another call from Bruce. Oh no, I forgot to cancel our date. And now he's at the mansion waiting for me. The problem was, Bruce couldn't find his sports car anywhere, and kept on making a fuss about it. I tried calling my foster parents to resolve this, but I couldn't contact them the whole evening. The morning after, I returned to the mansion to find strangers going in and out. Um, what are you all doing? Hi, we're moving in. Great to meet you, neighbor. It's such a catch to find a good place like this up for rent at reasonable prices, right in the local newspaper, am I right? For rent? No, no, no. What on earth is going on? I rushed into my foster parents' bedroom, but it was empty. Even the gifts they said they'd keep for me were all gone. They left without a trace, as if they were running away. What? Did your partners in crime leave you? Now don't you dare deny it, you fraud! What did he say? Partners in crime? 
Fraud? I tried explaining to him how I wanted to return all the gifts I received, but he wouldn't believe me. He threatened to call the cops if he didn't get his car back. Oh no, no way that's gonna happen. All I could do was beg Bruce to give me some time. This is the home of our town's famous sheriff. He's the only person who could help me, but all I got was, I'm sorry, but I'm retired. You're gonna have to ask someone else. What to do now? I was freaking out when, out of nowhere, no need for my dad. This is a piece of cake. I can give you a hand. I turned around to see a guy leaning on the door with a cold, arrogant look, and his arms crossed. Who is this guy? Can he really help me? We'll see. Wow, Alan really took the risk and invested a lot in this. A sports car, a mansion, expensive trips, and even this huge event. I have to admit, he looks quite handsome being all dressed up. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Alan, yep, the sheriff's son, is playing the rich heir of a big corporation chasing after a beautiful young lady, which is me. However, I didn't expect things would turn out so real. Alan's pursuit of me even made it on the local news. You guys must be curious how someone who's not a millionaire did this. Well, Alan convinced Bruce to fund our plan. He was hesitant at first, but he soon realized that this was the only way to catch the frauds and get his stuff back. So reluctantly, he agreed. Alan is indeed a genius, and his well-thought-out strategy quickly got the fish hooked. We were making headlines everywhere, and I finally received a text from my so-called foster mom. At first, she was just asking how I was doing, and talked about how busy they were with overseas projects, until today. Olivia, how's it going with that mysterious millionaire boyfriend of yours? He seems willing to give you anything. So you will consider him, won't you, darling? As expected, these money-hungry crooks wouldn't let it slide once they heard millionaire. So I replied to her that my rich man was treating me well and wanted to throw an extravagant feast this weekend to officially announce our relationship. And I hoped my parents could put off their business trip and come join us. Tonight was the night. Gosh, I was so nervous as my mom didn't reply to that message of mine. Will they show up or did they sense something was off? While I was super nervous, Alan came to me and held my hand real tight. Don't worry, Olivia. Everything will work out as planned. My, my. What is this feeling? It's undeniable that I always feel so safe being with Alan. The party finally began. Alan proposed to me with this rare, precious surrendered-by gem on a ring, which is one of the only three existing in the whole world. Everyone started buzzing. Alan's acting was so perfect, from his eye contact to the words he said, that I couldn't help but feel butterflies in my stomach. I... I do. When the party was over and all the guests left, I received a call from my foster mom telling me to go to the back gate. As predicted, they offered to keep the engagement ring for me. Drop the act, frauds! The two were still processing what was happening when the cops barged in and arrested them. It worked! Can't believe I've successfully tricked these notorious scammers! <laughs> what about my car? My Bugatti? Where is it? Oh. I almost forgot the main sponsor for this perfect plan. Without him, we definitely couldn't pull this off. Our stingy millionaire, Bruce Dillon. I bet there hasn't been a single day gone by that he didn't think about his missing gifts, huh? <laughs> that reminds me. This sparkling, precious ring, too. I quickly took it off, passed it to Alan, and told him to give it back to Bruce. But the minute the surrender by ring left my finger, Alan put on something else. Oh my god. Another ring? Your role as a millionaire's girlfriend may be over, but will you be a girlfriend to an ordinary guy like me, Olivia? Yes! A million times yes! After all this mess, I now realize that I've still got a lot of learning to do. So I've decided to listen to my parents and finish school. Turns out, if I really paid attention in class, it's actually pretty interesting. And Minnie is still my amazing BFF who let me have free reign to experiment on her hair. And of course, this cute future detective too. Babe, time to change your hairstyle.